think I perhaps should explain for those who aren't fully familiar with the arrangements that have been, or which we have attempted to put in place uh, prior to this hearing, that we had originally intended to see both the leave groups together on the 25th of February, uh, but it has been a struggle persuading everybody to uh, attend, uh, to put it mildly, and in particular one group's deep reluctance to attend uh, with the other group. And I'm pleased to say that the witnesses we have here today had never expressed any unwillingness to uh, attend the committee, nor sought to attach conditions to uh, their attendance. And I'm grateful to you for accommodating the changes uh, in the arrangements for this hearing and, and the postponements. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing the evidence this afternoon as our colleagues. Um, I don't think it's, there's much value in spending a great deal of the hearing on what appears to have been the acrimonious history between the two principal ca campaign groups for leaving. But I do think we, do, we need a bit of clarification on a number of the allegations that you in particular, Mr Banks, have made uh, about them. Uh, and perhaps I should just read a few of those out uh, and then ask you to comment on them. You said that their submission to the Electoral Commission was, I quote, full of lies and misrepresentations. You said that vote leave are lying and misrepresenting the situation, that these people are jokes, that he, in particular that's Matthew Elliott, wants to be Lord Elliot of Loserville, um, and, that, and that he, Dominic Cummings, is a liability and a danger to both uh, leave campaigns. Uh, I think you saw his evidence it, last week. To, to <laughs> <put> it, <laughs> so I think they meant to ask that question. To, to put it mildly, most of those, and I, I won't comment on the comment you've just made, um, do require a bit of substantiation, and I'd be grateful if you'd provide it now. So which one would you like me to start you with first? Go ahead with whatever I think in terms of the Electoral Commission, I think... Uh, Could you speak up? I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. You, do I need to lean forward? Or can, you can That's leave? Yeah, fine. Sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> in terms of the uh, Electoral Commission, our view of life was always that the vote leave uh, bid was the kind of establishment bid, if you like. When we looked at the bid we put forward, which was uh, the full backing of UKIP, um, Leave.eu had something like nearly a million public supporters uh, signed up into it. We had all sorts of different groups representing a, a very large range of opinion in the Eurosceptic world. And really, Vote Leave was a Tory campaign with a few uh, little additions to it. So it didn't really represent the wider Eurosceptic uh, view. And that's uh, how we saw it. Okay, but that doesn't take us to full of lies and misrepresentations. Well, I mean, their the, the submission had things what were the like... Lies? Well, as a good example, we funded Brexit the movie, which we spent nearly £45,000 putting money into the, the movie. They quoted it in their submission. They, they had one conversation where they basically said, if Mr Farage or UKIP are even involved in the project, we won't be involved in it. So that was put in their submission as a, a fact that they had you know, helped Brexit the movie to commission the movie and do, the, do those sorts of things where we had actually, you know, pretty well funded 50% of it. Well, as one example, I can give you lots of different examples. I think rather than to. delay the committee now, it might be yeah. helpful if you could set those out in writing and provide them to the committee. Absolutely, no problem. Uh, with, with any substantiating... I mean, there, there were things like... With any instance, substantiating... Yeah, there were things evidence. like, for instance, Richard North, who we don't necessarily agree with, but he violently objected to the vote leave uh, position, and it was quoted in the document that they had communicated with him and, and uh, worked with him. Well, we know that not to be the case. Now, when you say that the process, I haven't actually quoted all the great <coughs> points by any means I have in front of me, but perhaps I'll supply one more. Um, you have said of the Electoral Commission's mm. decision, I quote, we have decided to show the public how this process was stitched up yeah. So that seems to be an allegation not about lies or misrepresentation by vote leave, 
but about the conduct of the Electoral Commission. Well, we I'd contemplated, be grateful if you could yeah. substantiate that. We contemplated the judicial review uh, based on a number of facts, but one of them which was there are eight commissioners of the Electoral Commission, three of which excused themselves because they were conflicted. We don't know the reasons why uh, they were conflicted. But one of the commissioners actually voted on the decision that had a, a, a conflict relating to vote leave. But because they didn't have enough commissioners to form a quorum, they actually allowed someone to vote that was conflicted. And in the business world, you, you know, that would be out of the question and pretty reprehensible. Well, you're, you're subject to... Um, maybe we may decide to take as uh, subject to parliamentary privilege evidence on that point as well. It's a very serious allegation you're making about the Electoral Commission whose task is to ensure the highest standards in our elections. Uh, I have their, uh, their documentation in, in front of me here. Can I make a second point? Uh, yes, of course. Well, the second point was that uh, a couple of the prominent Vote Leave supporters actually communicated via the internet. They won the designation two days before the Commission were actually due to announce the uh, result, and uh, I think one of the, the people that's a very senior member of it actually tweeted out, "Congratulations, Vote Leave! You've you've won the designation." Sorry, a very senior member of a Vote Leave. Yeah, of, of not a senior leave. member of the Electoral Commission. No, 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 not of the Vote Leave campaign. We then wrote to the Electoral Commission by email saying, "What the hell is going on? You're meant to be announcing this Thursday." They then brought through, forward their decision by a day because they realised the news was out there. And it was clear that the Electoral Commission had either communicated the result prematurely to uh, vote leave or, or otherwise. But it doesn't give much faith in the confidence when you've got a, a date where you announce it and then the news is out two days beforehand. So call it a stitch up, call it what you like, but in my book, you know, if there's a process, you stick to it. It just does seem to have been an extraordinary fratricidal uh, <laughs> war uh, or tension here uh, between these two groups, bearing in mind you agree well, on so much. We agree on quite a lot. Yeah, there's some things we don't agree on. But if you look at the competition, I would say it's a good Thatcherite principle, sorry for the Labour uh, members of this committee, that competition is good. We raised nearly £9 million for the campaign. We wrote to over 10 million people individually. We sent out leaflets to a balance of another 11 million. So when you talk about the, the governments uh, in leaflets, uh, our campaign has nearly communicated with the whole country. So we raised £9 million. I think the competition spurred both sides on. That doesn't leave, leave aside the feeling that it was an establishment group that felt they had an entitlement to run the race, and it just become a, a Tory party cartel, effectively, with a couple of add-on players. And that was, and it was for that reason, therefore, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that you're saying that your group was unable to form a, an alliance, and a unified well, group, to make yeah. a bid. Is we wrote five times to vote leave to suggest that we should come together, and it was benefiting nobody to have this continuing round. Obviously, strong personalities involved in it, but I believe that, particularly with Mr. Elliott and Mr. Cummins, they believed it was their, their kind of God given right to run this campaign and no one else could be involved. If you take Vote Leave back to its roots, it was formed out of Business for Britain, and the original concept was this was a group that was going to be led by businessmen. Now it's led by politicians, mainly conservative politicians, as I say, that are trying to marginalise other people in the Eurosceptic world, particularly UKIP and others. So you can understand that we are slightly aggrieved at the process. Yes, although right at the heart of it is this allegation of a stitch-up by the Electoral Commission, and I think it's extremely important that you supply us with everything. Well, I'm very happy to do so. The, the, the two points that lead to a stitch-up is announced into the other side two days before the... Well, you've, you've made two points yeah. to us today. Okay, so, so we're, great we're to happy to substantiate it. Rather than, than us yeah. persist with this in any great detail now, as I said at the beginning, I don't think we want to have okay, half a hearing on this point. Well, well, you've asked the question. I mean, in the document, for instance, they quoted the support of Labour Leave, who had specifically written to the Electoral Commission saying that they were not involved with Vote Leave anymore because of their practices. And they didn't like them. 
So we've got a whole list of people that were quoted in the document that basically were not happy or willing to, to be involved. Well, it's, it's very helpful clarification, but in any case, we're going to get something in writing, and I think yes. it's on the basis of that that we may or may not decide to um, take this further in one way or another. I'd like to turn to a number of the statements you've been making about um, the cost of membership. Yeah. I'd like to turn first of all to the uh, cost uh, in terms of contributions to the EU budget, exchequer cost. Um, I notice that your website contains various figures for the amount that the UK would save. You have a figure for 12 billion and you have two very close figures of a little over 14 billion on your website. Which of those is the correct figure? Which year? Well, it's not marked on your website, which is why we're asking you. Well, I think, uh, you know, for, for clarification, the 12 billion is an estimate of the current year. And if you go back to the previous year, it was 8.5 billion, then 9.8. So I, I, I can't really dispute the vote leave. Yeah, well, come on to that in just yeah, a moment. Okay. But you've also provided a figure of 14 billion. I'd have to see the individual uh, thing. I'm not okay with everything we put out. It's on your website. It may well be. I don't read every single line of the website. I, I, think, I, think, can I, I think it's I'm not important. Trying to be, I'm not trying to obscure it. I'm just no, but I do think it's important question. that somebody in your organisation should be checking extremely carefully numbers as important as this. We have a research and making sure And making mm. sure that they're correct uh, and making sure that they're sourced well enough. And as you've just pointed out, you yourself have been asking me questions that I <laughs> might have asked you, which is which year do these numbers pertain to? Yeah, that's a good point. So that I'm not good in the I think in the interest of trying to get clarity in this campaign so we can all work off the same figures, it would be extremely helpful well, if, I think, your organization, uh, we, if your organisation document carefully yeah. in future uh, all these numbers so that everybody can trace exactly what they're referring to. We have to. a research department and per se the number won't be uh, wrong, but I do agree with you that the clarity over which year it pertains to is mm. quite important. I mean, if you you look at the kind of breakdown for 214, you start with a kind of gross number of 19 uh, million. No, we don't need to go okay, through it in detail now, but I, I know the points you're going to make, which I are, thought you were all about it depends detail. what you want to strip yeah. out. But again, I think it would be helpful if you, it's only in the interest of time that you supply that in writing to us. And I note the undertaking you've given this yeah. afternoon, that you're going to desist from putting figures out without having... Uh, make sure that they're very accurately sourced and also make sure that the existing figures on your website are correctly sourced. Mr Tice, you wanted to add... Well, I did just... One of the challenges with the figures and is that they do ebb and flow a bit and indeed uh, the ONS figures are different to the uh, HM Treasury figures for the net contributions by a matter of uh, over a billion pounds in 2014. So... It, it, it's a bit of a moving feast, and then how have they treated things like the extra money that we had but to send over? Merely but using a consistent figure and sourcing it will already take clear, you some absolutely way right. I accept that. down but the road of everyone yeah. knowing what we're talking about. You, Mr Banks, a moment ago <coughs> wanted to um, compare this to Vote Leave's estimate of 19. Hmm. Uh, what did you want to say there? Well, I think it's just disingenuous, and I think it helps neither side, both the in and out campaign, to have numbers that are... Why is it disingenuous? Well, I mean, it, in, in a sense, the, you, have, because it, you have the 19 billion, but I mean, I, I, I'm just talking at the top of my head now, I think 4 to 5 billion never actually leaves the UK, so to quote a figure which is technically okay. correct, but isn't... That's the point that we made in earlier hearings, right. it's the same, I think we can move on. Uh, from that, but I think it's it's uh, helpful clarification. Chris Phil. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Just to uh, briefly continue on this point about the budget contributions, um, the figure of 14 billion, roughly speaking, which you're quoting, does that include or exclude payments made by the European Union back to UK businesses and, for example, farmers? Well, I revert back to what I said. It depends on the the EU you're talking about, but no. That's the gross uh, contribution. Okay. So when you say there would be a saving of approximately 14, 12 or 14 billion, you are assuming 
a saving to the Exchequer, mm. the UK Treasury, you're assuming that all of those payments currently being made, for example, to farmers, just stop. No. no. Then how is it a saving? Of it's that, up that to level? the Treasury to decide how to deploy the funds it's now got, isn't it? But for there to be a saving, that expenditure would have to just... For, for the £14 billion to be realised as a saving to the UK Exchequer, those payments which add up to some um, approximately 4 to £5 billion, currently made for example, to UK farmers, yeah. they would have to just cease, wouldn't they? Otherwise, the saving, if they continued, well, the saving wouldn't I mean, be 14 billion. Hang on, hang on, hang on, yeah. question. If, they, if those payments continued, the saving wouldn't be circa 14 billion, it would be circa 8 billion. That's correct. So the 14, so for your 14 billion to be accurate, you, you are having to assume that all of those payments currently made by the EU uh, on science research grants, farm subsidies, would cease. No, it's up to the Treasury to deploy the cash it has available into which areas it wants to deploy it, doesn't it? You're saying they're not going to deploy it at all. No, no, no. You're saying they're going Well, implicitly, you're... Well, implicitly, no, you're, 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 you're even explicitly, I, I think that's you're, what you're saying. Yeah. No, I don't think that's right. I think you're putting words into our mouth. That's not what we're saying. The 14 billion figure, net of the rebate, that is the, uh, that is the gross saving to the country, and then the government of the day can choose how to deploy it. So would you... That's would perfectly you legit, that is a perfectly legitimate statement. Provided you state. explain clearly in your, in your rubric that's what, your, what the figure means. I suppose that might be correct. Sorry. Yeah, so is it your position that the government... Well, it clearly, if, your, if your 14 billion figure to be correct, if that is a saving to the Exchequer, you must be assuming all of those payments cease. Otherwise, the figure is not 14 billion. As I say, I repeat what I just said. You're putting words into our mouth. I'm not. The 14 billion is your figure. <laughs> no, but you, it's then what you do with it. The 14 billion is then open to the government of the day to invest and spend as it sees fit. That is a completely different thing from what so you've just would suggested. So, you, would you, would you, would, a, a, as, a, as an elector, as a, as a member of the of British society, would you wish to see the payments to, for example, farmers and the payments made to oh, fund I'm, science uh, work continue or discontinue? <coughs> and not only continue, but actually they could indeed increase because we'd be able to make those payments more directly without the huge bureaucracy and unnecessary cost and waste. That goes then, on in the European then, Union. So actually, people could benefit by more rather then, than less. Then were, then were we to withdraw, and were those payments to continue, as you're saying they should, the saving to the Exchequer would not be £14 billion, it would be £7 billion. Well, I mean, that's, that's a straightforward... Slight, I think that's a slightly nonsensical argument. You could uh, choose to uh, reduce the foreign aid budget by £5 billion to pay the farmers if you wanted. It's a Treasury decision. To link the two is irrelevant. I mean, it's a saving. You decide what to do with it. You're the parliamentarians. You're saying you would do with it as is, as is currently being done with it? Well, so first of all, farming wasn't invented in 1975. It was there beforehand. And how no, but the, subsid the subsidies were invented. How Parliament chooses to subsidise certain industries. I mean, the steel industry is a good example. You've chosen not to subsidise it. You've chosen to subsidise farm and you've tried to subsidise different things. You, you work out and, your own priorities. And let's be clear, we subsidised farming before 1975 and we will continue to subsidise farming after we leave the European Union. The great thing is, it's within our gift, it's within our choice and we can spend the money wisely. Well, I mean, that, that point is correct, but the, and I think we need to move on, but the, the, the fiscal saving, given what you've said, that you would, I, you would continue the farm subsidies, um, the, sa the, the, the saving to the Exchequer would not be 14 billion, it would be 8 billion, albeit that we control mm. that money. I think, I think the, Im the implication from what was said is that it's a saving of what we send to Brussels that we can then determine and take control as to how we spend it ourselves. That's the point. I think that is a distinction you might wish to... Um, draw more clearly when you mention figures like 14 billion. By the way, you're right. Which, is, is, which is back to the point that I made in my initial exchanges with you. Oh. I'm, I'm grateful to you for your commitment that you are now going to sort this out on your website and all okay. your literature. Yeah. But if I may just, in parentheses, add, we did ask you to supply us with all your literature yeah. and we haven't yet had it. Well, that's an interesting point, actually, because uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any request for any information and I specifically asked if there was any information required and was told there wasn't. Okay. So well, we will check that out at our okay. end. Great. It was received by other campaigns. If, you, if it wasn't received by you, mm. we'd be grateful if you could respond sure. to it immediately. Yeah. But, but, Sorry, take it, but taking on your point, the membership is only one component part of what we might potentially save from leaving the European Union. So, for instance, the regulatory burden and various other items doesn't come into that. So I don't think you can just take one item and say, aha, well, I'm glad you mentioned that because you have alighted on my very next topic. Good. Uh, 
You must possess some kind of psychic powers, or maybe somebody's saying that. Uh, who knows? Who knows? Right, so you mentioned the uh, regulatory costs of membership of the European Union, which was my next question. Um, what would you estimate the regulatory cost to British business of membership of the EU to be? I think it's unknown, but what I do know is if you attempt to harmonise all products and services across the EU, then legislate for that, it will be a very large number. Well, well it's not unknown no, according to your website. Finish. Hang on, hang on. Am I going to finish? Go on then. Yeah, OK. So, for instance, we export to the United States of America. We have to follow their rules. We have to follow the, 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 the guidelines they lay down. The same with Japan. So, with the European regulation, it's a, it is an added burden that is put on us because it affects all businesses, not just the businesses that export into Europe, which is not that many. So, okay. to give you a figure, Open Europe, think tank that you probably all know, uh, they estimate that the cost of the top, I think, 100 regulations is in the order of 33 billion a year. Mm -hmm. Now, clearly, there's many more than 100. Mm -hmm. but I think they, that their view was that was the largest 100. Yes, indeed. So when um, Mr. Banks said a moment ago, um, nobody knows, um, the figure your website does purport to know, your website quotes exactly the figure that Mr. Tice just mentioned. It quotes Open Europe's figure of 33 billion. So um, your website is a little bit less... Um, Nuanced in its uh, in its estimation. Well, but let's, let's be clear. That is that is the top hundred regulations, as I just yeah. said. There are clearly thousands of regulations that have an additional cost. I understand but there's, that. A, there's a tail. Okay, so your 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 quote, you're um, basing your um, public comments uh, on the Open Europe estimate of 33 billion. It's what you quote on your website. It's what you quoted just now. Now, Open Europe themselves, so the source of your figure, um, produced a note um, very recently, by which I think I mean in the last few days. Um, and they make clear that, in fact, they've gone through all of these regulations, these 100 regulations, and they say that although the current cost is estimated at 33 billion, they think many of these regulations, many of these costs, would continue to apply even if we left. Are you aware what Open Europe are saying is the feasible annual saving? I'm sure that's true, by the way. Okay. I'm not disputing that, okay. that that will be the case. Yeah. That's why I say the figures are known, but it is a, a number that is yeah. positive. But again, the great thing is, it is within the gift of the government of the day to strip away unnecessary regulations mm. from the businesses that do not need to suffer the yeah. burden. I mean, this is probably the point of the harmonisation of everything across 500 million people, by its definition, needs an empire of bureaucrats mm -hmm. and politicians to administer it. And it, you, I mean, the straight cucumber may be apocryphal, but it's right in the sense that you're trying to harmonise and produce a standardised approach to everything. So by definition, the regulations around that must be onerous. So I understand the point about, yeah. about where decision-making lies, and I understand the point about bureaucracy, but that wasn't the question I asked. The question I asked was, what did Open Europe um, say was the feasible I'm sure you annual tell saving? Us. I can't. I'm asking, I'm asking, yeah, since you're, since you, since you're quoting Open Europe, I'm asking if you know. I don't know. You don't. So okay. Don't well, it's 12.8. 12, it's 12 so, so Open Europe think that of the 33 billion cost, only 12.8 is a feasible saving, and they estimate that the maximum conceivable saving is 24 billion. So, again, I would suggest that in your public pronouncements and your website, um, you amend that, th amend or at the very least clarify that 33 billion, because Open Europe, the source of it themselves say that, that figure will not be realised. And let me talk about one or two... That's still a very big number, by the way. Well, that depends on the benefit you think accrues from single market membership, which I'm sure we'll discuss later. In fact, the estimates of single market uh, membership benefit are materially higher than the numbers we're discussing here. I mean, they're in the sort of 30, 40 billion level. Um, but I think colleagues are going to come on to that later. Um, to take an example, um, illustrating why this 33 figure... Um, isn't realistic. You mentioned well, the. Uh, sorry, can I just interrupt? I mean, yes. You know, you, you said the Open Europe uh, have just come up with something in the last few days. I mean, I don't know if you've got the date there, but you know, clearly, uh, you know, we've we've made representations on the basis of the information that we had at the time, uh, and and you know, anything tank could obviously change its uh, figures at any point. I think that the real point is there are tens of billions of pounds, and that just represents the top 100 regulation. I don't think you should underestimate. You know, there are tens of billions of pounds that can be saved every single year for the 95% of UK businesses that do not export to the EU and probably have no intention of exporting to the EU. Well, now that I've drawn... I think so you're pleading ignorance, I think, on this... On this no, I'm not pleading ignorance at all. 
But now I've, wait, now I've drawn your attention well, to it. Well, I am actually pleading ignorance because okay. I've read the report. So yes, sir. Okay, we've got a, we've got someone not pleading ignorance. Someone have well, when you when you've sorted out that um, divergence of view, um, you can perhaps amend your website. I now actually that I started off by saying that the the cost of regulation was unknown. You did. Didn't say that. But that's not what your website says. Your website says thirty three billion, and now I've pointed out for, what what Open Europe are now saying. Perhaps you can for amend. the top one hundred regulations. Yeah. So to take take some some examples, um, I mean, for instance. Um, one of the regulations uh, which has a cost is the um, EU, EU's um, Capital Requirements Directive, um, which is counted as a cost um, in the 33 billion. But, but, but for example, um, the UK government has voluntarily chosen to impose higher capital requirements on banks than is required under EU regulation. Um, so withdrawing from the European Union would make unless the UK government took a different view in the future, would make, again, no difference to the burden of capital requirement regulations on UK banks, would it? Because we're already choosing to go further than Europe requires us to. You're saying that's a cost of regulation? Well, I'm saying it wouldn't be a saving. If we left, then there would not be a saving. It's not a saving. I mean, a bank's capital is not either a saving or an addition. Well, it's counted as a co it's counted as a cost in the open Europe. Well, someone owns a bank. I would probably dispute that. I mean, that's a, a, a extra capital you have to put into bank. It's not the cost of business. Well, it's counted as a cost of business in open well, Europe's wrong. calculation. It's called cost of business in well, standard it's bank accounts. Well, I'd say it's wrong. <laughs> But again, the real point is... That's something you might want to take up with the Bank of England and <laughs> probably the Baal Committee. I've got a whole sheet on the Bank of England when you get to it. But it comes back to other people. It's, <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> the point is it is back within our control to decide what the level should be. In order... I mean, this is rather similar to the, the previous point. The capital the bank holds is not a cost of doing business. It really isn't. Well, it, well it's, a, it's a cost in the sense it means they've got to put... Well, it's a cost according to Open Europe, and you're quoting their figures, so you should take it up with Open Europe as well. Um, and it clearly it makes the bank less efficient in terms of a return on equity analysis. Um, but anyway, Open Blimey. Europe says... I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. <laughs> open, open Europe says it's a cost, and they're the people you're quoting, so take it up with them. Um, to take another example, um, when it comes to environmental um, and climate change regulation, which is the biggest single item in Open Europe's um, 33 billion total... Again, the UK government, rightly or wrongly, some might say wrongly, has chosen to go beyond uh, what Europe require in it. And, and, and we've signed up to this Paris Agreement, which is not a EU agreement, it's a, it's a multinational global agreement. Um, so were we to leave the European Union, we are still bound by this Paris Accord. Um, so again, there wouldn't be any environmental well, saving because mm. we're still signed up to standards I that are higher than Europe's. I think you actually put your, put your finger on a very interesting point, that a lot of the regulation that's coming now is on a world basis, not on a European basis. So in fact, um, the European Union is a wholly unnecessary middleman in the whole process, because what you're talking about there is that regulations for banking are made pretty much on a, on a kind of you know, uh, international global basis and implemented by the European Union or the Bank of England. So in fact, the European Union is just a middleman in the implementation of what is a lot of global rules. So, so that is, I mean, that, that, if that view is correct, and I think it is to a large extent correct, then withdrawing from the European... Looking simply at the money rather than the decision-making process and who decides, so laying to one side the sovereignty question, simply in terms of the, the cost of these regulations, pulling out of the EU would not deliver these amazing cost savings yeah, because we'd be signed up to these regulations you're, anyway. you're talking about very high-level things, banking, climate change and the like. So I'm not talking about them, you are. It's your figure, no, you you, it's on your website. <laughs> you're talking to me about them, okay? But what, I, what I'm saying is that these are very high-level things that are kind of discussed at an international basis. But we're talking about regulation that's imposed on small and medium-sized businesses from Europe. It does nothing to do with any of the stuff you've just mentioned. It really hasn't. And the cost of regulation as I say, is an unknown quantity. What I do know is it's a positive benefit uh, not to have 100% of these EU regulations imposed on everybody. That's, that's the key. It's pretty much the nux of it. OK. Well, I think, I think what we've established is that um, the 33 billion figure that you've quoted on your website has been disowned by its own author, Open Europe, and I look forward to you clarifying that on your website. Now I've drawn it to your attention. And secondly, a lot of these savings would not be realised um, because, because we're signed up to the regulation anyway. So I think, I think I've made that point. You've made a separate point about sovereignty and who takes decisions, which no doubt will get explored later. Um, but I think I've established the point I wanted to, Chairman. So, can I, can I just clarify on that? Um, the 33 billion was a cost, right? Yeah. 
the, what you've referred to as their recent report, which I accept I have not seen, I think you refer to what actually could be saved. There is clearly a difference between a cost and a saving. Well, it's, so it's, 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 okay, it, well it's, uh, it's So we're absolutely clear on that we're comparing apples with apples. Yeah, well, you're implying that the 33 billion, you're implying in your web, on your website that the 33 billion pound cost would be saved in its entirety. They're saying only part, if we left, they're saying only part of that would be saved. Okay, well, look, we're very happy, of course, to check the implication. If the implication is wrong, that's one thing. If we've referred to it as a cost, that's another thing. So we'll check that out. Just to clarify, you're not alone in using this figure. Mm. Boris Johnson has used this figure. <laughs> and, we're in good company uh, then. And Vote Leave have been using this figure. Um, and it's in response to cross examination of those. Um, that Open Europe have felt the need to clarify uh, what they've been doing and, and, those, and those hearings. You did make another point, though, Mr Banks, which I think is significant and may have uh, <coughs> substance but requires work to substantiate, which is whatever the view may be about these big mega regulations, the top 100, the fact is that uh, the small man out there... Yeah is being hit by hundreds of little regulations and those all add up and they carry a cost and it seems to me that if your campaign uh, wants to have maximum impact it might consider trying to work out and substantiate a figure in that area because in order to try and fill the gap between the 13 and the 33 that appears to have opened up in Open Europe's work since we started examining it carefully, a, uh, you, you feel it should be filled by that calculation. Is that something that you well, might I think consider? It, you know, as someone said, it's better to be roughly right than precisely wrong. And I think if Open Europe can't um, calculate the, the numbers, well, they it's spend not the easy. Long doing it. It's, it's not, not easy, easy to, to do. do. And to be yeah. fair to Open Europe, as I pointed out last time, if you look carefully enough, even in their original use of these figures, though perhaps it's not as prominent as it might have been, uh, the qualifications are there well, to be read and to be I mean, found. Much maligned Norway um, only implements, for the last 15 years, 8% of EU regulation. So clearly they mm. presumably implement stuff that's high level and big and uh, choose to discard stuff they don't like. And furthermore, the suggestion which a number of people have made uh, including Mr Johnson, that Open Europe was saying 95% of these uh, benefits to regulation of setting this gross cost figure, and everyone's agreed it was a gross cost figure, 33 uh, billion, uh, may not materialise. In fact, that, as Open Europe have clarified, and indeed did, did clarify in their original document, if you look carefully enough, was a reference only to the energy and climate change package of regulation, uh, as a right. substantial but nonetheless relatively small part of the total figure. Uh, Rachel Reeves. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Banks Mr Tice, for coming to um, our committee this afternoon. Uh, the Treasury have estimated that the economic impact of leaving the EU would be £4,300 per household. Um, Mr Banks, I think you said that this was a bargain basement um, price. Uh, do you think that £4,300 is a price worth paying? Well, what I, uh, what I said was that uh, if it was correct, um, even if it was correct, it would be a price worth paying to get back our own democracy. So it, in that sense, that's correct. But I said if it's correct, if you actually look at what the Treasury uh, report produced, it, it estimated over five years the growth would decline from what would be, instead of 37%, it would be 29%. Now, any Treasury forecast fails almost at the first hurdle because you just can't forecast the, these kind of things. It's almost, it's almost impossible. They, 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 they then quote the GDP as the household income, further, you know, kind of complicating the numbers and just... The whole spin of what it I'm interested in, in getting at, though, um, Mr. Right. Banks, yeah, is um, if it is a correct figure, you do think that that would be a price worth paying for leaving the European My Union. View of if, life, it, if it yeah. was, if we would take that <laughs> yeah. as given, you think that would be a price worth paying for leaving the, the European Union? The number quoted is the most optimistic Treasury forecast I've ever seen, ever. 
That would be a sum, every assumption. My, is Mr. Correct. Banks, I, I just I, 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 opened, I opened up by saying yes. But, so yes, you think that that is a, a price uh, that. worth worth paying. This and that, isn't that about is, pounds and pence. It's about our demand. Well, let's go into what it is in terms of um, pounds and pence. I think it's twenty-one pence an hour, which is about five pounds a day, one hundred and fifty pounds uh, a month. I think many of our constituents uh, would regard one hundred and fifty pounds uh, a month. As a quite a substantial amount of money, money that they couldn't yeah. afford to be without. But you would say to those people that £150 a month is a price worth paying this is a for leaving the European this Union. This is a 15-year estimate that clearly is wrong before it even starts. But, you, but, but yeah. Mr Banks, you say... I would say... Even if this I was say correct... Then I, sorry, well, Mr Banks. Okay. Even if this is yeah. correct, you believe... And it's a perfectly valid view, you believe that £150 uh, a month is a price worth paying for leaving the European Union? I would That's say right, the figure is massively incorrect. But you but would say it, that that was a price worth paying? Do I yes. Tell yes. <laughs> I believe it's massively incorrect, but if it was to be the case, I would still uh, advocate leaving. Thank you. That, that's, that's, than that. that's No, that, and that is very clear. Thank you very much, um, Mr Banks. So... The case for Brexit, for you, is more about an ideological principle um, rather than an, a, an economic cost-benefit analysis. Is no, it's that both. Be a... It's both. I mean, if you look at the, the formation of the economic crisis in Europe, it's broadly been brought about because the euro was introduced as a political experiment rather than an economic experiment. Germany has a currency uh, rate that is 35% too cheap for its economy. The south and the east have got a roughly 35% too expensive. And the thing is ripping itself to pieces. I, 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 and I, I would agree with you yeah. on that, Mr Banks. And so, keeping uh, us out of the, um, the euro was one of the best decisions of the last um, Labour government. But we're not in um, the, the, the euro. This referendum is not on the euro. It's on our membership of okay, the If I can EU. finish what I was going to say. So you have a, a, an economic situation that can only be resolved one way. And that must be by total integration of the remaining countries. And it must be uh, with a massive transfer of surplus from north to south and east. That's the only way it can be resolved. So this concept that we can kind of sit on the edge of it um, and avoid the worst of it is wrong. When the crisis comes, it will invariably suck us in. We paid for the Irish crisis, we paid for the Greek crisis. We will invariably be drawn into this. So my, my uh, supposition is that economically it's a disaster. And I would pray almost any price to be on the, uh, you know, away from it. Well, I mean, one could argue <laughs> that sure. even if we weren't in the uh, EU, we would be affected by a, uh, a crisis on our, on our doorstep. Yes. But uh, also it is the case that um, um, the, the, the Prime Minister um, um, has got us an opt-out of paying uh, for, for crises relating to um, the, the, the euro, the single um, currency. I, I'll just go back to my, um, my point, though, because my, my question really was, y y even if there is an economic cost, for you, Ms. Mr Banks, it is um, the, the ideological principle, which, you know, again, is, is totally valid, um, but I'm just trying to get at you know, where you're coming from on this, that is more important no, than no the cost benefit cost cost of analysis. Leaving. I mean, the basic bottom line is even if you took the worst case scenario, which is where world trade organisations and pay the tariff, that's two thirds of our membership fee. The fact of the matter is that this assessment is based on a load of falsehoods. It assumes that there's full single market in financial services. Uh, the EU trade deal we do is no better than Canada, and there's no productivity gains from any of the regulations. Well, I mean, I mean you, if you had to put together a work of fiction, the Treasury report is that. Well, then let's look beyond the, the, the Treasury re report. The, the IMF, the World Bank, the OECD, the London School of Economics, Oxford Economics, uh, all of the <coughs> economists and the major investment banks, investment banks have all given opinions indicating that Brexit could be economically uh, uh, damaging. Um, why would all of them... Um, be making the same well, as a, argument as, as a bank. bank that had no mortgage debt on its books uh, in 2008. Every single one of those institutions missed what was spectacularly the biggest financial bubble the world has ever seen. I think they're just wrong. I mean, the, the Treasury recommended the RM, the PEG, 
that they, they destroy more British industry than the Luftwaffe. Well, the, tre the Treasury also recommended no. <laughs> that we don't go into the, uh, the, 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 the euro, no, something well, that well, you would have uh, agreed uh, with, on, Mr Banks. On. In 2003, the Treasury suggested that if we join the euro, it would increase our exports trade by 50%. You know, yeah. the Treasury's track record is not good, nor is the IMF. The IMF suggested we should join the euro. The IMF also criticised George Osborne and his austerity package, saying that it would lead to massive unemployment four years ago. You know, they have a woeful track record. They are led by a massively Europhile uh, person. And, you know, thank heavens George Osborne didn't listen to them four or five years ago. You know, but you can't pick and choose. The reality is, you talk about economists, probably our four of our best city economists, uh, so Roger Buchel, Ruth Lee, uh, Tim Congdon, and the Mayor of London's economist, Gerard Lyons, all have written papers and recommend Brexit. And they are, I think some of the most highly respected economists in the City of London. Well, let's look at the most respected uh, economists and institutions. The Bank of England uh, governor has said that Brexit, he said this at our committee, was the biggest domestic risk to financial uh, stability. Vote Leave uh, thought that this was scaremongering. Do you think that the Bank of England governor is well, scaremongering? I, <clears throat> I was on Newsnight that night after he spoke, and I made it very clear he was referring to a domestic risk. He also referred in the same hearing to the global risks, which were much bigger, of what's going on in China, what's going on with the commodities crisis, and by implication, what's going on in America. Businesses have uncertainty and risks every day of the working week. This is just another uncertainty that will be there for a period until we negotiate a new trade agreement. But he made it very clear, it's a domestic risk. Yes, it's a, a domestic risk. It's yeah, but he also said, he also said, sorry, he sorry, said, sorry, he, um, Mr. Tice. Well, you he said it was the biggest. You shouldn't have general elections because a general election, people start getting worried about what's going to happen in the general election. There's always risk. There's always uncertainty. The, the, this political or politicians' ideas that you live in this kind of risk-free world that doesn't have risk attaining to it. We control nothing. Yes, and that's general elections, uh, Mr Banks. Yes. It's up to the uh, electorate to decide. And at this referendum, it's up to uh, the uh, voters to decide whether we stay in right. the EU or, uh, or, or leave the EU. But when they're making that decision, they need to know what the risks are. And the Bank of England governor said not that the referendum was the biggest uh, uh, um, domestic risk, but that Brexit was the yeah, big, biggest domestic risk it to our financial uh, stability. It's not an argument no, uh, against the, referenda or no, against no, but, elections, but, but, but is about okay, telling people agreed. what the yeah. risks and implications of their decisions are. But in general terms, establishment politicians, civil service, don't like change. So by definition, any change is a risk and is, is, is uncertainty. But I do think it's important yeah. to have the overall context, which is in the same hearing he referred to the global risks, I don't think it's right to just cherry pick uh, and infer that that's all he was uh, alluding to. Uh, I wasn't, um, Mr. Tice, I, um, uh, um, cherry picking. Um, um, I recognise that there are many risks uh, to financial stability, both global and domestic. But I would argue that at a time when our economic recovery is still uh, fragile, you would have seen the GDP numbers today showing that GDP growth has fallen, that construction, uh, investment and agricultural output uh, have all fallen, it would be a, 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 a dangerous time to take on more risks. And the Bank of England uh, governor, and you've spoken about other economists' uh, uh, views, but I would uh, um, uh, argue, and I think most people would see the Bank of England governor as the most respected uh, economist. He he thinks it's the biggest domestic risk to uh, financial uh, stability. Uh, you don't um, well, by the uh, way, share I don't that view. I believe it's the biggest domestic risk to stability. The Bank of England has printed £500 billion of quantitative easing. It's brought back bonds, uh, its own bonds. It's collapsed interest rates to zero for eight years and created asset bubbles all over the place, from property to stock market to the like. The what? biggest domestic risk this country faces is deflation is asset bubbles. What do you think the uh, implications of leaving the EU would be on interest rates, Mr Banks? In what sense? Well, what do you I think, think will happen to <laughs> interest rates, interest Mr rates, Banks? Are, interest, so interest rates in America are zero. Interest rates in my, Switzerland my, are my, negative. You, interest rates in Japan are zero. And interest rates in the UK will remain zero because everything's buggered. Yeah. 
And that's why, and that's why it's all at zero. Well, so you can say that the interest rates go up. But, I didn't but say. Uh, Mr. But I'm saying it won't. You know. Mr. Banks, I didn't say anything about what would happen to interest rates. I was asking Sorry, your. No, no, Mr. Banks. The way these committees work is we ask questions and, well, and you ask them. Well, I, you, you haven't listened to the question. Yeah. My question was. What do you think, Mr Banks, will happen to interest rates in the event that we leave the I European Union? I was attempting to answer that, that interest rates will be either, either zero or negative, and they will remain at zero or negative in this country, whether we Brexit, exit or Lexit or do anything else. So okay. you don't think there'll be any implications? Absolutely not. I don't think there'll be any implication at all. Uh, interest rates are not set by whether or not we are a member of a political union, and for people on the Remain camp, such as the Prime Minister, to suggest that mortgage rates would rise is complete and utter nonsense. What interest rates are set by totally different economic factors. By the way, interest, interest rates should rise. Do you think it's normal to have 0% interest rates? It's telling you something, isn't it, really? So you think that interest rates should rise if you were the Bank of England or the Mental Policy Committee, a, you'd put up interest no. rates? I'm putting words into my mouth. What you I just said, said they is, should rise, Mr. I Banks. said, in a normal course of events, it's not normal to have 0% interest rates. It's telling you that something's very wrong, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> interest rates are 0.5%. Uh, uh, that's the. You know, the they've got banks. negative interest rates in Switzerland and Japan. To well, I'm not asking deposits. about interest rates in, in those countries. What do you think will happen to um, sterling? Um, Mr. Banks, on the event well, of us leaving the yeah. European Union? Sterling's a very good question because you talk about sort of tariffs on world trade and stuff like that. The actual, in the last three months, the, the pound euro rate has dropped 10%. That's worth double the tariffs on, into World Trade Organization rules into Europe. So effectively, a fall in sterling is not a bad thing at all. We're running a massive trade uh, deficit. We're running a current account balance deficit. In fact, our currency deserves to be a hell of a lot lower than where it currently stands. So do you think then, Mr Banks, if we leave the um, EU, uh, sterling will um, fall? I don't think it matters whether it's not Brexit related. Sterling goes up or down and currencies go up or down, depending on how the markets feel about the underlying factors of the economy. It's nothing to do with Brexit whatsoever. But, but, it, but it would um, have uh, an, an impact, wouldn't it? Uh, because, the oh, sorry, sorry, the, yeah, because the, the, the value of, of um, a, a currency uh, depends on uh, people's investors' propensity to invest in, um, uh, in, in gilts, in equities... Uh, Etc. Uh, in the, the country. So I'm just asking what you think will happen to I'm sterling asking, but I'm wondering in the event of, 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 um, of Brexit. If you want my opinion, I would say mm. it would drop, that it would recover. Um, that's the way of markets. I mean, in the mm. last three months, uh, the pound has dropped nearly 10% against the euro. In the last week or so, it's recovered 3 or 4% up. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you think then, um, um, this is very yeah. interesting, it's an important issue as well. So you think the, the immediate impact of us leaving the European Union would be sterling um, falling against presumably uh, the uh, euro and against the dollar? Well, look, in a world where economic orthodoxy has been suspended for the duration until it all hits us in the face, um, which is unfortunately where we've been for the last 40 years or last 20 years, at a lower currency rate. Everyone in the world is trying to reduce their currency rate, and they're doing it by quantitative easing. So the Japanese are printing money to try and reduce the value of the yen. The dollars, they're printing money to reduce the value of the dollar. The Bank of England's printing money to reduce the value of the pound. They're all trying to reduce their currency rate to become more competitive. So the event that it did drop 10%, it would matter not, and in fact it would probably boost our export position. Well, well two, two things. Uh, first of all, uh, the main reason for quantitative easing and low interest rates is to try and stimulate uh, domestic demand through both investment and, and con consumption. Um, but the implications of, of sterling falling would be that the price of imports um, would go would go up, yep. uh, and of course we are uh, a net importer, so that would have a, um, a positive effect uh, um, on um, on inflation. So you would expect, uh, at least in the short run, for um, the costs of goods and services <coughs> to go up in the event of us leaving I the European everyone, Union. I think everyone worldwide is trying to fight deflation at the moment. 
is the, is the enemy nice. rather than... So you agree that the, the, at least the short-run impact would be uh, higher prices? No, no, no. Well, no, no, I, sorry, I, I, Mr Tice, I, I was asking Mr, Mr Banks. I don't want to dominate it. Cause no, no, well, I, I, I'm asking you the, you the question, <laughs> Mr Banks. The, 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 the point is that um, you have to have a balance between exports and imports. If you're saying, would prices domestically go up because the pound drops, yes. Is that a bad thing? No. OK, thank you. That, that's very helpful. Can I just, can I no, just add to that? I'm, I'm, I'm if you have something you particularly want to add, well, yeah. I think let's, let's be very clear. Uh, if sterling drops due to short-term currency speculators by you know, a few hundred traders in the city for a few weeks, that is not going to have an inflationary impact. The biggest risk we, that most developed economies around the world have is deflation, not inflation. So I think that's very important. And, uh, you know, the, the, the reality is currency on a medium and long-term uh, basis, currency rates are set by uh, all sorts of things uh, and how well an economy is doing and the perception okay, of the ability to repay debt. So there's, great deal, uh, it's yeah. wrong to just draw the analogy and say Brexit would be, you know, hugely damaging for sterling. Well, I mean, I would have the conversation with Mr Banks. Most people believe uh, that sterling would uh, fall... Uh, uh, Mr. Banks uh, um, seem to agree with that, and of course, uh, that pushes up the price of uh, imports, which pushes up uh, domestic uh, inflation. That may be a good or a, or a bad thing, but it it's just important that we have the facts. It, ma it makes the exports more competitive, and it depends how long it falls for, and whether it's whether it falls in the next week as a function. All, of all those, all those things, all those things are, are true, <clears throat> but it is important that people understand. Uh, um, what the impact of Brexit would be, and I think that's been a useful discussion. Thank you, Chairman. Helen Goodman. Thank you. Um, Mr Banks, I want to bring you back to this issue of the bargain basement price mm. for uh, leaving the European Union. I'm not sure whether you're aware of the uh, median household income in this country. 45,000? Uh, no, as a matter of fact, it's 25,630. Well, according to the Treasury's report. Today. And the uh, median weekly earnings are 27,456. So if uh, people had to pay 4,300 for uh, leaving the EU, their incomes would fall from 25,500 to £21,330 a year. Mm -hmm. Do you think those people would feel it was a bargain basement? Price? Well, the figures that the Treasury have quoted are over 15 years, and they quote the 45000 uh, as the household <coughs> income when you get to the end of the 15 years. So whether that's the difference between what it is now and what you get to, and, the, and that's the cost over... 15 years, so you're I, talking about apples and pears here at all. Uh, I think these are yes, in I'm 2015 prices. If you look at the Treasury no, but the four document... 4,500 is calculated over the no, period of... 4,500 expressed in terms of 2015 GDP in 2015 prices is what they're saying. So it's yes, but, it, but it's in 2030. Yeah. I know it's in 2020 or 2030, 30. but the prices are on the basis of this year's prices. So it's not that we've got masses and masses of inflation. By, 20, by 2030, can, that number of 4,300 will be much yeah, okay, so higher. What, what they've done in the report, as I understand it, is they forecast the growth will be... Instead of 37%, 29%, based on a whole series of factors which I think are erroneous. So I start from the position the report is just a bunch of rubbish, which it is basically. I mean, you, you, you can't forecast over 15 years. In a business, you're lucky if you can forecast over six, years, uh, six months and a year at the outset. And beyond that, it's just a complete wild guess. So the numbers you're quoting, I just think, are fanciful. Well, uh I could contest what you're saying about long-term forecasting, which in fact I think is easier than short-term forecasting, but we won't go there. I'm just trying to get you to focus on the fact that a drop of £4,300 for the average household would be some 17%. And to ask you, really, when you reflect on this carefully, do you really think that most people would regard a drop in their annual income of that sort of...
quantity as being above it. I certainly regard our parliamentary democracy and the right to make our own rules as paramount above anything else. I don't think people, when they hit the beaches in Normandy, were saying, well, this is going to cost us 2,000 quid. They were fighting for democracy. And I know it's an extreme example, but it, that's the way I feel about the European Union. OK. I have to say, though, to forecast something over 15 years and to come up with a 37% growth rate or a 29% growth rate is just statistical nonsense. Well, the truth of the matter is they gave a range depending on which Did scenario you see the equation? we went to. And the range was from 2,600 to 5,200 yep. with 4,300 depending on what the, the negotiation was. But you think that it's not, it doesn't really make sense to uh, do these sort of calculations. So could I ask you why you've included similar calculations on your website? You've got two numbers You've for the financial impact on households. Yep. You say staying in the European Union would cost the UK £9,625 per household in one place. And in another place, you, you say you would be better off to the tune of £933. So you, are, you, you do, in fact, think these sort of, sort of calculations okay, well, are meaningful, and you have put some numbers on your I'll website. I'll, I'll, I'll answer one part of that question. The £930 is a calculation based on cheaper food prices and a range of costs that are incurred under the EU. So I, I don't think that's a forecast in the sense of 15 years out. If there is a forecast there that is a long-range forecast of more than a couple of years, I would agree with you. So well, if that is on there, we point us to, the, to where it is. And could you tell me why it. you've got two such wildly divergent numbers on your website? 9,625 9, and 933. Which number are you banking on? Which number are you well, I, don't, I, I have to see the... The well, these are your numbers. They're yes, not my numbers. They're your yeah. numbers. Can, can, can I just say, first of all, we produce probably enough uh, material to cut down a small rainforest. Um, I'm not familiar with every single last bit of it. The £933 I am, that's based on lower food costs and, and, and things like that. In fact, Patrick Minford from Cardiff University calculates it's upwards of £2,000. So there's lots of varying figures. But uh, any long-range forecast is inappropriate. Well, so I if think there is one on there, I would take it down, but I, I'm not familiar with I that. think it's, it is very clear, just to reinforce what's just been said, the £933 number, that is an annual forecast. So it is much easier, clearly, to forecast for an annual saving. And there's a key difference between a 15-year forecast that you were previously alluding to. I think the 933 number is consistent with the 33 billion which you, w you no, were discussing it's, it's, with uh, No, that's the oh, it's, it's different. Things, yeah. So, uh, the 933 so what's the 933 based on? That's, that's based on, that's based on uh, data that came from the Change or Go report by Business for Britain in the middle of last year. And, uh, and that's so that's, that's not the costs of regulation? No, that's, that's the overall saving. Uh, so it's no, it's not the cost of regulation. It includes all sorts of things. So what does it include? Well, I haven't got it in front of me, but it was it was after a you know it's a thousand page report, which looked at uh, in very detail at, at, at all sorts of uh, aspects, and that was its considered number, and that I believe is the number that Vote Leave also used because it was you know it was sourced from Business for Britain, their predecessor. So you're saying that that number includes the costs of regulation, the contribution to the EU budget, and the impact on the British economy. Well, let's do with food costs. Yeah. Or it's just to do with food costs. No, it's, it's, I'd it's, have it's, to refer it's, back to it. I just it's a long list of it. items. I mean, is it just to do with food no, it's costs? No, it's not. It's not. But said, that would suggest it was about the CAP I and agricultural tariffs. It's just to do with food costs. I said it's part of it. But I, I, I'm not, I would have to go back and actually look at that. It's a long list of items, but, for example, on the food costs... It's the, uh, the lower food costs because you don't have tariffs on non-EU food products, for example. But it is a long list of items, it's very carefully considered, and I think it's a... Very uh, carefully considered, but you actually can't tell us what it is. Well, I haven't got it in front of me. I mean, I've, I've well, been through it previously, but... 
Okay. We're not walking encyclopedias that carry huge amounts of information in our heads. That's everything. I'm trying my best. That's everything. I, 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 I can tell you. I can tell you. I can, re, re, I can reiterate just. For the record, I have been through it, and I thought it was a very good working document. Good. Well, I'm I'm glad you I'm it glad you I'm glad part. when you read it, you 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 felt that. But it's not very enlightening for us on the committee or for the general public. Well, it's a thousand-page document. It. It's a thousand-page document well, that's on the Vote Leave website. You've obviously had a copy of it. I think it's, it's can just, anybody can read it and, and review it, and they can either agree or disagree with my perception of it. My understanding is that the 9,000 number uh, comes from an analysis by Patrick Minford, of whom you were speaking earlier, and that that number works on the assumption that you're going to repeal all EU legislation on social matters, employment matters, and the environment. Do you think that's realistic? I haven't seen the report, and I'm afraid you've got us on this one. Well, I can go away and give you a written answer, but I haven't seen Patrick Minford's report, and I don't think the 933 is based on his report. No, but the 9625 is, and you've got that number on your website well, We have a research well. department that employs about six different people that is going through all of this stuff. They're ex I think they're pretty accurate, but if you've got a specific number that needs to be justified. I cannot justify it right now. I don't have the... Well, well what I'm trying to... The point that I made yeah. at the beginning again, really, yeah. we shouldn't need to be having these exchanges. I'm sorry, Helen. But we, should, we shouldn't need to be having th this information, the core information, to enable us fully to understand what, where these numbers are derived from, how they're put together. Uh, but Mr Chairman, be they're often a matter of opinion. Should, I mean, it's should, what, should, mm. should be available on your website if you have qualifications yeah. because you have personal opinions about them as well. Of course, those are also things that could be added. But what we have out there from your organisation are a range of numbers which is very difficult for us to understand and therefore are virtually meaningless in the hands of the public. It's after all the public who are complaining noisily a lot uh, that they are not able to get high quality information from either side of this campaign and that they're having to rely uh, on numbers which seem to flake a little when they're looked at carefully and that appears to be what's happening with the numbers that we're addressing it, that we've found I think on, it's from a your valid, website. I think it's a valid point but when you have a situation where you've got a Treasury report that's saying it's a downside of We're going to cross-examine the, the chunks yeah. no, no, on, on this report. Have, I'd really yeah. rather concentrate on the numbers that's on your website. Helen Goodman. Uh, my understanding is that uh, Professor Minford is saying that all social and employment legislation should be repealed. So are you saying that in your vision of how life would be better after Brexit without the uh, pressures for legislation in the social chapter imposed by the EU, you would want to have no holiday pay, no maternity pay, no um, constructive dismissal rules, no discrimination rules. Are you saying that you would like to see all those swept away? No, not at all. So, in fact, you wouldn't get those savings? But I don't know. <laughs> you're, you're quizzing me on the report. I haven't read. I can't answer your question. But on the so question which social and the... employment legislation would you like to maintain? I don't think I would want to move, remove any of it, but that's a matter for Parliament. I mean, the, the, the beauty of this is the powers return to your good selves and you decide what you're going to do. But Mr Banks, don't you seem to understand? You have claimed that these savings would be achieved. They would only be achieved if certain pieces of legislation you're that, were repealed. I haven't repealed. read the report. I am telling you what you have told the public those savings would only be achieved if that legislation was repealed. Once I point out to you what legislation would need to be repealed, you seem to be running away from the statements which you were quite <laughs> confident of when you walked into this room. I'm not running away from anything. I haven't read Patrick Minford's report, therefore I don't know whether your characterisation of it is correct or not. You, also, you, see, you seem to be I saying that... It would be very yeah. helpful if two things occur. One is you write to us, yep. please, that, and two, that you make sure that your website fully clarifies what these numbers uh, pertain to, so that the public themselves and others who want to sure. check them. But uh, just going back judge. on the social protection and the rest, it's up for you to elect a Labour government yeah, and well, to put in place what you want. Yeah. But I don't but think I, just for the sake of, sorry. Okay, Helen. 
can't, you've got the floor, unless I you've got something important. Well, important I, I think our website does source all this information, and we do accept, everybody accepts, it's hard for the, uh, for the public to identify uh, numbers, but our website is very clearly sourced so that people can then click through and read the report for themselves. Okay, I'll ask you some questions that don't involve exact numbers then. I'll ask you about foreign direct investment. Now, the Bank of England, uh, which my colleague Rachel Reeves was talking to you about before, fear that uh, volatility and uncertainty will mean that we will see a reduction in foreign direct investment into this country. And indeed, this is borne out by statements from major industrialists like Nissan and Hitachi. And I'd like to ask you, uh, first Mr Tyson, then Mr Banks, uh, whether you don't have some concerns about the loss of this foreign direct investment and the impact on jobs in this country. I have no concerns about that at all. Uh, initially, I'm going to take you to a 2013 report, I believe by Ernst & Young, of over 2,000 multinational businesses that asked specifically whether they thought Brexit would make the UK more or less attractive for multinational businesses. And uh, for US and Asian firms... Uh, both of those uh, ge geographies uh, said that over 60% of those firms said it would make the UK a more attractive place. And I think the proof is in the pudding, isn't it? If you look at what's been announced just recently, in the last few months, in the knowledge that the opinion polls are very close on Brexit, you've had HSBC decide after a two or three year review that they're going to retain their global headquarters in London. They could easily have deferred that decision if they thought it was going to be a major problem until after the 23rd of June. They didn't because London has so many other major attractions to offer. Let's take Boeing, big US corporation, Boeing. Okay? They've just recently announced in the last couple of months that they're going to locate their European headquarters in London. Let's take Avon Cosmetics, a US corporation, just announced they're going to move their US headquarters to London. The Pentagon, the Pentagon no less, uh, under, the, uh, under the auspices of the, uh, the President of the United States, have recently announced a £200 million investment in Oxfordshire. All of these are fantastic news, and it is because of the attractiveness of the UK economy and our workforce and our transparency and our legal system and language, they have nothing to do with Brexit. So I think the proof is in the pudding of what corporations are doing, and no, they are not withholding long-term investment decisions. And let's take the car businesses. There are a number of car businesses over the last 12 months who have confirmed that actually it would, Brexit would make no difference to their UK investment plans or their UK jobs. That's not true, I'm sorry. I'm sorry it is. <laughs> it is. I'm sorry, it is not what they have said. They have made it absolutely clear that this is central I'm sorry, we fundamentally opinion. disagree. Uh, last year, the head of UK Vauxhall said it would make no difference to their plans. So you think that the fact that BMW have written to their employees advising them that it's in the interests of that firm to stay in the European Union uh, is com can be ignored? And BMW is, comes from which country? Germany. Of course so they're going to say that. that. What, what does that prove? Yeah. Well, it, it's in their interest. Germany wants us to stay in the European Union because we're the only <laughs> two Germany. major net, con net contributors. <laughs> it, is not true, it is not true to say that all of the car industry leaders have said that it would damage their UK investment plans because they haven't said that. And indeed, last year, a number of them said the opposite. So we can go back and check the statements. So you're, you're, but your, your basic view is you're not worried about this... You think that lots of people are still investing, and uh, when 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 I when I say to you, well, Nissan doesn't take that view, or Hitachi doesn't take that view, or BMW doesn't take that view, you say, well, well, maybe maybe we're, I, I've given you, you some specific, that off, I've, no, I've given you some very specific examples of investment in the last couple of months that have been announced. I would just, I mean, you you, you yourself mentioned the President of the United States and he did have something to say on this and he was pretty negative about leaving Europe I think you would agree yes. last week and, 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 and for very clear reasons look, it may suit the United States but what suits the United States doesn't necessarily suit the United Kingdom and it's interesting isn't it, he's not going to be in power for much longer but um, I believe well certainly in the last 24 hours for example Ted Cruz has said we would be at the front of the line not at the back of the queue Mr Banks, do you have anything to say about foreign direct investment? The only thing I have to say on 
bar is I took my son to his piano lesson uh, on Monday night and the piano teacher said to me, we all something to do with Brexit, aren't you? Mm-hmm. I don't like that, Mr Obama coming over and telling us what to do. I think I'll switch from an unchanged... Mr, uh, Mr Banks, I'm not asking you about I'm your child's <laughs> piano lessons. I'm <laughs> asking <laughs> you about your views on foreign directors. Well, a little bit of levity, surely. It's not, a, it's not, a, not do or die, surely. But the I know, but we the, haven't got that long, so... The bottom, like line, the bottom, li- the bottom line is that... Uh, um, <laughs> When, when we didn't participate in the euro, we were warned that all the banks would leave London, the hedge funds would go, it would be a wasteland. London is the number one preeminent capital in the world, and, 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 and there's more hedge funds and banks you can stay, shake a stick at. They look for the, the, the fact that it's English-based, it's got a legal structure, it's all sorts of different things, and it doesn't mean that because you're not part of the European Union, you're not going to get direct investment. Well, I do not you believe brought that me to, to the, the case. exact point that I was hoping mm. you would uh, come to, which what, which is um, that there is, there does, you do seem to have a lot of financial experience. Uh, you've uh, served as CEO of Manx Financial Group. You're currently chief executive of Southern Rock Insurance. Mm-hmm. Mr. Tice has been director of Valley National. Banking Corporation. Do no, you? F- <laughs> Never heard of it. Well, it's in so the CV which country. you've submitted to the committee. Oh, you call it you, the the CV which which you have given to us <laughs> says that you are chief executive at Quidnet Capital Partners. Is correct. that correct? Uh, you've been a partner of Tice Farms. Is that correct? It's not a CV that I've submitted to you. It's from Bloomberg. Well, if oh, it's from Bloomberg, the then from let's Bloomberg. be very clear, it may or may not be accurate, and that is not accurate. So you, you haven't been director of CLS Holdings? I have been chief executive of CLS Holdings. I don't know what you've got in front of you. It's not from me. It's not from our organisation. Um, there's no such entity called Tice Farms. I've never heard of the banking corporation that you referred to. Very happy to give you my CV. It's on our website. Um, I was chief executive of a multinational uh, listed property company for four years between 2010 and 2014, which included operations in France, Germany and Sweden, as well as the United Kingdom. It's now a FTSE 250 business. So yes, it was a billion pound business, very successful. um, And I took it from a share price of £4.70 to almost £14, tripling it in four years. So, you know, I'm quite proud of that track record. Well, that's very impressive. Um, can, can I just add one point, which uh, just on foreign direct investment, which really is important, actually. The largest sovereign wealth fund in the world, Norwegian one, recently, in the last few weeks, confirmed that even if we voted for Brexit, they would continue their investments in the UK, if not increase them. That is another example from the ones I just previously gave you. I think it's just complete scaremongering to suggest that FDI is going to cease or reduce post Brexit vote. Well, you're both very successful. You've been very successful um, financially. So I just wonder why Mr Banks said that his campaign would be won against the establishment of international bankers, multinational corporations, uh, tax dodgers, and so on and so on and so on. Well, I started my business with a desk and two telephones. So I built my business from scratch. I'm not going to apologise for... Um, owning diamond mines in South Africa, banks in the Isle of Man and various other financial businesses. Um, it's my you know, strong held opinion that it's the establishment that wants to stay in the European Union and large corporations that like the European Union. So, so your, definition, your definition of the establishment is not what you said, international bankers, multinational corporate tax yes. dodgers. Your definition is anybody who wants to stay in the EU. No, no, not at all. That's misrepresenting me. I mean, the, the EU is a construct for big business. I mean, you talk about the social chapter legislation and the rest of it. The real reason for the European Union is for large multi-corporations not to pay their taxes. Well, which is pretty much the reason it's there. To have heavy regulation so that large business 
can compete on an unlevel playing field with small business. Well, the sole it, reason it, for it sounds quite establishment to me when you think that the average income in this country is twice what it actually is. Don't I was you quoting think? from the Treasury report where it would be in 15 years' time, which okay. was the question you were asking. All right. Okay. Sorry. Jacob Rees-Mogg. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming in. And what I, I think, alone on this committee of you is your noble patriotic service, backed up, <laughs> backed up with your money being where your mouth is. And I think many Eurosceptics in the country at large are extremely grateful uh, for that. That it's been one of the things that uh, has ensured that we can take on uh, the establishment, which seems to spend taxpayers' money fighting its own particular corner. Um, I, we've got a, a couple of sort of follow-up questions. <laughs> Uh, I just wondered if you'd noticed, because Ms. Banks, you said you had some notes on the Bank of England, uh, that when two members of the FPC came before this committee for their reappointment, they were asked what they thought the major risks to the UK economy was. Neither of them thought it worthwhile putting in Brexit. Uh, when questioned, one said that she'd forgotten, and um, therefore had she thought more carefully about it, she might have put it in. Uh, and the other said, well, actually, he thought it might be a brief short-term risk, but didn't think it seriously. So uh, I wonder if you might like to refer to any of your other notes on the Bank of England and how you feel that well, helping I think I, I think I sort of covered that. that. The biggest domestic financial risk, I think, is quantitative easing. And the, uh, well, uh, not just the Bank of England, but worldwide. Um, the inflation of asset bubbles everywhere, particularly property, particularly, um, you know, share, um, shares and other things. This is the biggest domestic risk we, we face. I mean, we talk about uh, the fact that with uh, open-door immigration, it compresses wages for normal people. Over the last seven years, the Sunday Times rich list has doubled. And the reason for that is that the free money at 0% interest rate is not getting through, as someone over there said to the consumer, to spend more money. It's going directly into asset bubbles. And these asset bubbles will spectacularly un uh, unravel. So, and so Brexit or otherwise is, a, is a probably a mere sideshow to what's coming down the track. And so do you agree with um, Lord Rose, who when he came before this committee said that if we left the European Union, uh, wages for the lower paid would actually go up? Well, it, it's a fact. I mean, it's de supply and demand. I think, reading back from our old economic book, that when the Black Plague came along, the Black Death, um, workers' ra wages went up 40% the following year. It's no surprise that if you've got a lack of uh, um, um, sort of uh, supply, then prices go up. So I would say that to contra the you know the fact that sterling may drop and prices may go up, I think wages would almost certainly rise. But even George Osborne hasn't yet suggested we'll get the Black Death if we <laughs> don't remain in the European um, Union. Um, that may, that may <laughs> be <laughs> what's coming <laughs> in the next few weeks. There's one supply and demand that if you don't have workers, wages go up. I think, um, I think where we differ from. Uh, Stuart Rose, Lord Rose, of course, is that we think that would be a good thing if uh, domestic wages were to rise. And, of course, George Osborne also thinks that's a good thing, so they clearly differ there. I don't believe the minimum wage is a living wage, and I think uh, it, you know, this is uh, key, key to the problem. And I, and I think what, what we're seeing from the rallies that we've been holding up and down the country is that actually um, working-class people have realised that the impact of uncontrolled, unsustainable immigration from the EU into this country is that there is a significant suppression of wages. And people are understandably very, very upset about that. And do you recall the figure from the Treasury's report of how many will come in between 2030 as part of their economic forecast? Uh, three, three million. Three million. million. Three million. Yeah. Um, and um, I think that report's worth looking at a bit, a bit more because um, it also assumes that there's no saving from regulation at all, do either of you think that is realistic? Well, I, I think as I answer to you, I think there is a saving. I think it's probably overblown at 33 billion, somewhere between the two. Um, I can't tell you for certain. It also assumes as one of the major costs that we would apply unilateral tariffs at the same level as the common external tariff to EU products coming into the UK. Could that possibly be reasonable? Was anybody in the Leave campaign suggesting that we do that? I mean, let's be honest, it was a work of fiction designed <coughs> to achieve a particular aim to suit George Osborne's requirements. You know, no credible economist has looked at it, as far as I'm aware, and said that actually it's a work of art. Do, do you recall what the Chancellor said 
on the 17th of May 2010 when he set up the Office for Budget Responsibility. I'm assuming you can. I can, <laughs> yes. Um, he said, again and again, the temptation to fiddle the figures, to nudge up a growth forecast here or reduce a borrowing number there, <laughs> to make the numbers add up, has proved too great. And that is a significant part of the reason for our current problems. I believe the public should be able to trust official forecasts for the economy. I want independent forecasts to become the norm. Um, why do you think he's gone back to Treasury well, forecasts? I certainly don't trust anyone that's doubled the national debt in six years. It would be my stance on the Outrageously <laughs> true. Um, <laughs> I wonder um, if, if I... Have I missed something? That's not, you say it's not true? It's true. part of the deficit. The deficit. The deficit. I didn't say that. The 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 you know how it works. I, I, I think exactly how it works. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's slight, slightly wandering away from, from this particular argument. <laughs> oh dear. Of our, uh, um, uh, but I, you also touched briefly on interest rates. And again, I'm going to ask uh, you to recall things from your memory. Um, the exchange rate mechanism, uh, European <laughs> activity. Uh, put interest rates up to 15%. So the only time when our involvement with the EU has had an effect on interest rates, it's been to put them up to a level that bankrupted uh, thousands of businesses and put hundreds of thousands of people out of their homes. Is, is that a fair? Yeah. Thank you. So can I now come on to how we might leave and what um, uh, leave.eu's view uh, is? Because there's been some speculation about a second referendum, indeed, most EU countries, when they don't vote the way the establishment want, it gets told that they've got to vote again. Do you think that is a realistic possibility? Even if you don't want it, uh, do you think that there is a, a chance that we may be forced to vote well, again? I think, uh, I think everyone seems to be viewing this as an event, which I think it isn't. It's a process. Uh, where I differ with Vote Leave and some of the senior Conservative politicians is I think we should invoke Article 50 almost straight away. And you go into negotiations for two years over the, uh, over the outcome. And I think, you know, it's as straightforward as that. Um, John Cunliffe, who appeared before this committee, who was up rep, um, uh, said that what he thought should be done was we should spend a limited amount of time preparing the way to exercise Article 50, to see the lie of the land, yeah. Allow tempers to cool a bit. You broadly in agreement? Yes. With I mean, I, when I say immediate, I don't mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Away, but within a. <laughs> but, but within a sort of, you know. But by uh, Christmas. Yeah. yeah. That sort of thing. I think um, if the British public have voted out, they don't want the equivocation of the politicians then starting to uh, reframe it. And we don't want to be treated like Ireland, Denmark, no. France, Holland. So and to have before well, to, to I vote. think, you know, let's be clear, Article 50 starts the process. And yes, there's a reference to two years, but there's no need for it to take two years. It could take shorter with the right negotiating team. And I think that is a key part of post a Brexit vote, is actually who is going to represent the UK's interests. And what I think is absolutely fundamental uh, is that it should not be people who have advocated to remain uh, with the sort of scaremongering that they've done. So it, in the nicest possible way, the last people who should be negotiating a Brexit is uh, the Prime Minister, the Chancellor or the Foreign Secretary. It needs a team of, in my view, the best uh, negotiators from the world of business. Uh, the suggestions that we shouldn't Brexit because we haven't got enough civil servants to negotiate uh, a free trade agreement, I mean, that is one of the most feeble, weakest arguments to do with, you know, for the future of our national sovereignty. We haven't got some negotiators. I mean, really. Well, the, the OECD forecast out today, and I completely agree with your view of these international bodies, which consistently get things wrong, um, and very often catastrophically say, so. it's quite right to point out they didn't predict the crisis in 2008, and, uh, and, and so on. The, the OECD assumes we will get no free trade deals with anybody until 2023. That would require spectacularly inept negotiation. Yeah. Well, so it's just not credible. It's, 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 it's again, it's completely incredible. Well, the average European Union uh, trade deal takes seven years because you've got to get 28 people to all agree on the same thing, which is virtually impossible with the vested interests they've got at play. One country actually negotiating by itself is actually in a better position to do it because it doesn't have to coalesce all these ridiculous vested interests. 
Absolutely. It's interesting, isn't it, that a, a country the size of Switzerland can have free trade agreements with a cumulative GDP of, um, I believe, four times the cumulative GDP of the free trade agreements that the EU's got. And I think we should remember, you don't have to have a free trade agreement in order to very successfully trade with, a, um, uh, with another country. For example, we have a greater uh, trade surplus in services with the United States of 350 million people, with whom we do not have a free trade agreement, uh, than we have uh, our surplus in uh, services with the EU of 500 million people. So you don't need trade agreements in order to very successfully trade with other companies. You know, as, a, as a good example as well, because the World uh, Trade Organization has brought tariffs down, it's almost a kind of uh, a rounding error in the equation. So, you know, you look at the... the the potential tariffs we would face in, in Europe with our products, it's only two-thirds of the cost of the membership. As I was explaining to uh, Mrs Reeves, the currency has moved 10% in the last three months, which is twice the size of that tariff. So the biggest moving part is your exchange rate, not the potential tariffs. And the exception on that is, of course, food, where there are still very high external tariffs from the European Union, yeah. which is the major additional cost to... Yeah. Um, households in this country of our membership. Yeah. On an ethical basis, they, they, uh, they destroy farmers in Africa and other people with this kind of policy. Thank you very much. Mark, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, can I carry on on uh, trade and what trade will look like after, after Europe? It's very interesting, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Tice, you were discussing with Mr. Reed Mogg, the, the potential of, of uh, and I think you made actually a very valid point, I and mean, as you know, I, I disagree with your and objective in this whole thing, but I do think you made a very important point, which is to use the argument that we don't have anybody who knows how to negotiate a trade deal as a reason not to leave as, as, as completely ludicrous. And I do accept that, but nonetheless, it does actually raise a very, very important point. I mean, we have not negotiated a trade deal in this country for many, many years. And um, whilst it might be nice to have some business leaders who come in and do this stuff for us, at the end of the day, why would a business leader give up running a business to come along and spend years or, or, or months, who knows? negotiating a trade deal. So it is um, an important point as to what we can achieve with what we've got. And, and what I would like to understand from you is what, what you envisage we can potentially get. So um, on, the, on, the, on your website, um, you, I don't expect you to remember all this, but I'll read it to you. You say, <coughs> um, you say the remaining EU member states will seek a trade agreement with the UK that, the, that seeks to maintain the same level of free exchange of goods, services, and capitals as is the case today. So basically, kind of broadly speaking, the same, uh, the same, the same as we've got now. And you go on to say that um, the vision for Brexit is that the UK would decide in its own laws to regain control of important issues such as our borders, again, which is kind of integral to this whole thing. The problem is, of course, you're now introducing a level of, of discrepancy. In order to have the same deal with Europe, it would be understandable, the EU rather, would be understandable if we had the same uh, agreements with them in terms of other things. And yet, what I would be interested in from the two of you is, is how you see us being able to get exactly the same trading relationship when we remove, for example, something like uh, the free movement of labour across borders, which would in effect make us have a better deal with Europe than the Europeans have with themselves. How are we going to achieve that? Well, I think that, that was part of my question to Mr. Rees Mock that the tariffs that you're talking about that when you trade into Europe are less than two thirds of our current membership fee. So effectively, it's well, not I'll a, it's I'll not come a, come a huge, huge issue. But, but, but we're, not, we're not talking about tariffs. So you're, you're, you're talking about potentially getting an identical tra trade deal. But, but so, so essentially, if you like a. Yeah. A, a Norwegian type of model without the free movement of, 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 of labour. Yeah, I mean... It, but how, how do we get that? But that's what I'm saying, that the financial consequences are not particularly severe. I mean, uh, the USA trades into Europe, China, Canada, all sorts okay, of... OK, so what you're people. saying is we won't get the same trade no, relationship with I Europe. I said the worst-case base scenario, if you didn't, would still not be bad, but you, of course you would do a better deal. I mean, well, the, we're running a massive. No, no, no. But, but your website, just, just to be clear, yeah. the website does. Um, you do say the remaining EU member states will seek a trade agreement with the UK that That's seeks to maintain the same level of free exchange of goods, services, and capital. Germany exports twice as much no, to no, us so, as they do to us. So, 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 what your site is saying is that you're going to have a non-tariff trade agreement with Europe. Yes, I think that would so merge extremely thing. rapidly. 
So, so you have a non. So, so this is my point. Yeah. You'll have a non-tariff trade agreement with Europe on yeah. goods and services, uh, but <coughs> uh, so identical in every sense we've got in terms of the trade. But you also say on your side that we'll regain control of important issues such as our borders. So, yeah. what you're essentially saying, taking those two statements together, is the deal we will have with Europe will not only be better for us, but it'll be better than the deal the Europeans have amongst themselves. That's rather the point of it, I think, yes. Well, how are you going to achieve it? Well, yeah. well I think, I think the, the point, point is, <laughs> at the end of the day, uh, we import uh, substantially more goods from the European Union than we export to them. So we have the negotiating leverage because it's more in their interests to continue to export the 1.2 million German cars and others. So <coughs> it's in everybody's vested interests to negotiate agreement, and it's in everybody's vested interests uh, from all countries to do it quickly. So, you know, I think that's that's the first point. You know, our surplus, of, our surplus, of course, I, is, is with services. That. I'm going to ask you to unpack that statement, because it's, it's, it, th th this is a, an argument that's used frequently by the by the Brexiteers, is that <coughs> if, because we have such a good trading relationship with Europe, they will happily do, do all of this. Uh, I can't remember the numbers off my top of my head of what our exports are as a percentage of our GDP, but I mean our total exports uh, to the EU are 148 billion pounds a year. It's 12 percent. 12 percent of our GDP. It's it's. I mean the reality of it is, the total trade with Europe to to the UK is is, is less than 10 percent. No, it's not. The government figure in their pamphlet was completely wrong. Well, then what is it? 16 percent. Okay, but nonetheless, it's still a very small part. Well, no, trade it's amongst. Not. Well, it's, it's I think I think it's, this this is it's really important. But, 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 but these but are people and jobs we're talking about. It's no, not no, percentages. No, no, so I appreciate that. But are you saying that Europe is going to turn around, the, the EU, sorry, when I, if I refer to Europe, it's interchangeable with the EU, but the EU are going to turn around and say for a 16% of their, of, their, of their total trade externally with one country, they will give a better deal, a better deal than anybody else in the world has got, including mm. members of the EU. Why is it a better deal than anyone else in the world has got? Well, who else has got... Has got Tariff-free trade. Well, I've just told you tariffs are a very minor point. Of no, no, but no, 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 no. Tariff-free. Well, ta tariff-free. Yes, right. I know, but it's a minor consideration. It, 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 yeah, but, but the point, the, the, yes, but you can't sort of, it's like trying to nail jelly to a wall. No, it is, and I'm giving you a very clear answer. But, 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 you, but you, either have, no, you either have tariffs or you don't have tariffs. Your, your website is suggesting we have a tariff-free deal and a free movement of people free deal. <coughs> it doesn't exist for anybody. Whenever I keep trying to press you on that, you say, yeah, the tariffs don't matter. Actually, they do, because you're, you're avoiding, the, well, you're avoiding answering the question. So, so who has a zero tariff deal on goods and services and, and without free Well, let's, let's be very clear. Uh, the Canadian agreement that is currently going through, as I understand it, that is 98% uh, tariff-free on goods. But it doesn't include services. Well, so, but, there, so there, but there are no tariffs on services. No, no, sure, but none okay, well, but it's important Hang on, you can't us. take that. Well, there are no tariffs on services. There are, there are barriers to entry on services. And let's exactly. be very clear, the single market, after 20 years, is far from a uh, non-tariff barrier-free zone. You know, there are still huge barriers not, uh, to uh, the market and services. And indeed, yeah. and indeed... Um, there are people who suggest that actually many EU countries have no interest in removing those barriers to services. So Mexico has one. Uh, your <laughs> <laughs> give the man a better job. Is that what <laughs> but it's, um, um, so that includes services. So there's no. Oh, so they, they have and the services is a good example. Okay, that it, it's not a single market in services. Why do we keep saying this? No, but it's a developing single market, and we're, and we're well, committed well, to, to deep de de developing. How long have we got to wait? You know? I mean, we've waited 20 well, years, we and it's still not a single market in service. Sure, but if we're surprise, outside, surprise. we have an infinite amount of period to wait. Surprise, surprise. Okay, let, 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 let me ask some other questions, because again, there's... Let um, just go back to the question you asked us. I wanted to be clear on that, that the worst-case scenario of no deal... By the way, Mexico, just, just, just to finish up on that point, one. My mental gears have been working to catch up. But, it's, uh, but Mexico is a very, very small e economy. We're, we're talking about the fifth biggest economy on the planet. It's all very well. It <coughs> kind of makes the point. That but we, we are would, incredibly important. But we would have more leverage than Mexico as the fifth largest economy in the we're world. Their yeah, but they've got more to lose we're their, in, we're, Europe, in the we're, EU. That's we're, the their, we're their biggest single export partner. And Germany has a surplus in goods that it exports to us of over 30 billion a year. And we all know... What Germany says... 27.278 in billion. Right. It's well, a massive number. Bye-bye.
Let's let's be clear. Um, yeah. Germany has a huge surplus in goods to the UK, and uh, we all know that what Germany says goes uh, in terms of what happens within the European Union. But Ireland has a 10 billion deficit with the UK. Luxembourg 1.3. I mean, look at Italy. I mean, I grant you these things, but, 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 but the point is, but hang on, because the point is, is that you've got to negotiate a trade deal that satisfies all these people, all these countries. So you're quite right. Germany has a very, very huge incentive to, to negotiate the best possible trade deal it can get. But Ireland has the opposite incentive. So now what you're proposing is that we're going to negotiate a trade deal with the whole of Europe. I mean, look, you, you make a very, very good point. If Britain by itself can go to the rest of the world and negotiate a trade deal with Mexico, okay, so we can negotiate a trade deal with Mexico, and it'll be 27 times easier, 28 times easier to do it, because we don't have to think about 27 other countries. That's absolutely right. But this deal you're proposing that we're going to have with Europe is negotiated with 27 countries, and you're right about Germany. You know, well, you weren't wrong about the number, but you're right about the principle. But that same principle applies to Ireland, and Ireland will want to have the opposite type of deal because it has a different set of interests. Ireland has a huge interest in financial services. Germany has a huge interest in the auto industry. We've got to get all of them happy. And you're talking about the fact that we have this very significant... Uh, very, I mean, you know, part, nearly half of our exports go to... Go yeah, to, go to yeah, you've got to allow us to uh, ask questions, and then we've got to... Uh, leave you to try and answer the questions as how, as someone else was explaining to you earlier this afternoon, how it works. Carry on, Mark. The, the, the point is, is that our single biggest trading partner has, has exactly the problems that you've suggested that creates a problem for us negotiating with the rest of the world, that there are going to be 27 nations with very, very diverse interests that will eventually want to come, uh, you know, come up with a solution. So I think it's 48% of our trade is with Europe, so it's a very, very significant amount. That is very important to our economy, and you're suggesting that we will easily create a trading arrangement <coughs> which will be a zero, which actually will be a better trading relationship than Germany's trading relationship with France. And I, don't, I defy you to, to come up with, a, with an answer which is plausible, which, which uh, refutes that. Well, well, the, the, that the, the two parts of the question... The second one that no one, you know, the Irish are interested in financial services, Germans in cars, all the rest of it is the very single reason that the EU is lousy at doing trade deals around the world. Because and when they try to do a trade deal, they can't agree on anything. I so agree it's with the, you. I agree it's the with you. As you're talking, you know? I agree. I agree with you. You're, but you're now talking about us doing a trade deal on 48% of yeah. our trade. With, with an organisation which you say is lousy. But I'm pointing out to you the cost of the tariffs, because tariffs have generally come down worldwide, is almost a rounding error in the calculation. Well, I mean, I, something let, like let, 7 let, or 8 billion let against, me talk about against trade of 300 million globally. Let me talk about tariffs. If you look at a, at a WTO tariff, I think the WTO base tariff is what, 2.4%. Okay. Yep. So, so our exports to the EU 148 billion, imports from the EU 226. This is a goods of 226 billion. So we have a 78 billion deficit. But anyway, you look at those uh, goods tariffs. That comes to actually nine billion pounds. If you look at these numbers, um, so so actually this is the you know, kind of the, the, if you like the most basic cost of the EU. If you look at uh, so I've taken these from the Times. I know there's lots of different sets of numbers on this. This is as good as any. Um, our 2015 contribution to the EU was £17.8 billion, of which £4.9 billion is a rebate. Yeah. So that never leaves a country, but obviously comes back onto the books. £4.4 billion of cap and uh, payments and uh, structure fund payments. £1.4 billion of, um, of, of contributions to companies and grants to companies. That's a £7.1 billion, uh, if you like. Th th that we, we spend £7.1 billion pounds buying that free, uh, that free trade agreement. Well, the, the, uh, I think free the, net, tariff the net number is 8.5. Take your numbers. Um, I've never this one out. So hang on, 17.8 minus... 4.9 minus 4.5 well, right, comes to 8.5. Okay. And, and can I just clarify? Well, well, you did pick me up on figures earlier. Um, it's not 48% of our exports. It's 44% according to the ONX. Okay. And that is before, very importantly, yep. that is before what's called the Antwerp uh, Netherlands distorting effect where our exports okay. go... Sh yeah. I'm sorry to be technical. No, 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 that is a very important point. Okay, uh, uh, that, uh, that is exports that go straight through uh, yeah. the Netherlands or Antwerp to the rest of the world. When you, to do, when you deduct that number, 
our exports to the rest of the EU are probably somewhere in the mid-30s. Fair enough, but would you not accept that they are nonetheless our biggest trading yes, partner? Yes, and, and, and we the are theirs, and that's and why that. it's in everybody's vested interest to get this to right, get this right and to do it quickly. Okay, but just getting back to this, this 17.8... Well, hang on, hang on let, me, let me just finish the point. The, the 17.8 billion minus the stuff that comes back comes to somewhere around 7 or 8 billion. That's against, against tariffs of, of 9 billion. So actually, at a, a, but what's interesting about this, of course, is the government is spending the money, whereas it is the consumer that potentially will be suffering. So actually what, what exiting the EU would do would be transferring a, uh, a, a cost to the government, which comes out of taxpayers' funds, and that's spread evenly amongst everybody, whereas it will then be directly attributed to those consumers who buy uh, European goods in that high street, and also those businesses that are selling goods uh, into Europe. In the unlikely event of a tariff situation. But why is it unlikely? Well, it's very unlikely. Why? Because it's why not in anybody's interest. Unlikely? It's but just not in anybody's interest. And, and, and I think the, the simple way through it, guessing. the simple way you through it, the, the way that business people would address this is to say, I'll tell you what we'll do, you we'll, we'll impose, we'll impose zero tariffs, tariffs on the Sorry. European Union, and then it's up to the European Union to decide whether or not it wishes to unilaterally impose tariffs on us. Well, frankly, if it did that, it would look just spiteful and we revengeful. We choose what we want to do in terms of tariffs, and yes. Europe <coughs> what it wants to do in terms of tariffs. So negotiating deal, I mean, you talked about Mexico, um, uh, having a zero free tariff. And again, I, I will go and have a look at that and find out a bit more about it. But nonetheless, the chances of this happening straight away are very, very remote. It, look, you may be right, because we don't know what's going to happen. It is entirely possible you're right, but you, it's not going to happen overnight. Well, I think it's going to take some time for this to be negotiated. For the reasons you've argued, is why we should leave the EU, is because the EU can't negotiate quick deals. I think you have to look at what is in the best long-term interest of the country. And, what you, and, and I don't dispute that there will be short-term pain of leaving. I don't dispute that. What, do you, what effect do you think that's going to have on families? In what way? Well, we know that um, families, uh, households are very highly leveraged at the moment. They have been higher leverage, but as you, you know, you've talked about asset bubbles, we saw in the lead up to the financial crisis, household debt as a percentage of household income increased from 100% to 175%. That number is, is absolutely fixed at about £1.45 trillion. Pounds. Nothing's changed, but of course household income has gone up. Households are vulnerable to a whole load of different uh, you know, potential factors that might affect them. There's a number which you would have heard, which is somebody's come up with a figure of 3 million people will lose their job if we come out of Europe. I agree that's nonsense. I agree that's completely rubbish. But what that number does reflect is 3 million jobs that have a relationship with Europe in one way or the other. And to, a, to an extent, those jobs may be at a little bit extra risk as we go through this short-term pain, which you've agreed. Those jobs could be at a little bit of extra risk. We've also um, had a discussion with Rachel Reeves a bit earlier, talking about what happens in the event of, uh, of us coming out. We've already seen fluctuations in the, in the currency, um, and the currency seems to be following, actually, the opinion polls of, of whether we're in or out of Europe. Um, the key point is, if you look back to the 2014 Bank of England stress test, they create a scenario where something precipitates a, a crisis in, in, in confidence, if you like, in the economy. And one of the outcomes of this is you see sterling collapsing. As a result of that, because exports don't grow as quickly as imported inflation hits the economy, the Bank of England has to respond by rising interest rates, and rising interest rates reasonably quickly, reasonably fast. Now, the modern... The modern neutral interest rate uh, is, is expected to be something in the region of two and a half to three and a half percent. So let's say it goes to two and a half percent. You're now increase. You're now picking up the cost to households of a doubling of the cost of their mortgage, and that's quite a significant problem to households. That that's what you're suggesting is an acceptable short-term pain. And I think I it's completely no, no, <laughs> You said it was acceptable to have short term pain. Of course That's it what is. I'm defining what the pain looks like. Well, and we I don't agree with your definition. Acceptable. I mean, as, as we said Come earlier, you know, there is no link between being a member of the European Union and our interest rates, which are set by completely different factors. No, no, no. Th that, that's not what I said at well, all. You just said that mortgage rates were going to go up if we left the EU. No, no, no. No, I didn't say that. I said that there would be a. You would be open that it could be short term. Uh, effects in the in the markets and short-term term knock-on effects. What I've done is played out a scenario which was put forward by the Bank of England in the 2014 stress test, where it looks at something that precipitates a, a lack of confidence in the economy, which can then take on um, a number of um, 
a number of implications in terms of, of, of tightening of credit, in terms of uh, you know, problems with the housing market and all the rest of it. But the point is that if you see a sustained pressure on sterling, and this is a hypothetical situation, but this is what can happen, if you see a sustained, sustained pressure on sterling because of a, a, a lack of confidence in the UK economy because we've come out of things. Now, I know it's a chain reaction, but it's important that you can play these things out or you can see how these, you, know, you can war game these things. You then, you then see a collapse in sterling, you then import inflation before you boost your exports. You're right, exports could be boosted, but you could import inflation quicker because of the, uh, of, of the short-term effect. And the Bank of England's only response can be to rise interest rates in order to, to counteract that. If you don't mind me saying so, it's just a ludicrous supposition. Well, it's not, because it it's, a 20, it's a 2014 I, I mean, I I could sit here and say, well, the current construct of the euro is ripping itself to pieces. The currency of the euro will collapse and sterling will rise. I mean, you look, can put any the, scenario the, you the, like. By your own admission, it's a war you game, could, and I think that's yeah. an extreme theory, which is... Totally, totally implausible. But can and, you see a situation? Not going to happen. I mean, but, but, but the, one, the starting point of this discussion is that we both agreed that there could be short term pain. And what I'm trying to do is to define what short term pain could possibly look like. What you're not doing is saying what you think short-term pain would look like. And it's up to you to be pain, honest. Does, does pain remaining inside the European Union? Yeah, but at least it's quantifiable pain. Coming is it, well, outside it's, is, is it? It's not. It's not. I mean, let's be very clear. The one well, thing so in this we'll referendum... We'll get on to that. What we're really asking when you just heard <laughs> the question uh, is what is the short-term pain in your well, view? The I think That's the, the question. Okay, let's, move, let's move from the word pain to the word uncertainty. Okay. Well, well, pain was your work. Pain right. is fine. But, pain you know, fine. nothing... Let's be clear. With our relationship with the European Union, nothing changes until we sign a new agreement. So it's not like something's changed the following That's day. That's not true, actually. If you vote Article 50, you start the process of coming out. That's yes, from and you've got two years to negotiate a new agreement. agreement. And you've then got the option. You can either agree to extend it, or you then move on to WTO tariffs. Yeah. So it's not true to say that immediately the following day. I think, you know... Um, and, and the benefit of serving Article 50 is that you actually reduce the period of uncertainty because you start the negotiating period with serious earnest. Can I just ask one question? Well, we talked about it. It's quick, quick because we have a vote at 27 minutes yeah, past, sure. and I'm not intending um, to The Dominic comment is just on the, on the, on the services mm -hmm. point, because we haven't discussed any of the services. We have a, a £17 billion pound a year uh, surplus with Europe on, on services. This is kind of quite an important point. I mean, clearly, you, know, you would agree that there's a potential problem with, um, with Europe that have non-tariff uh, restrictions on us having services. But do you, um, uh, Dominic Cummings, yet last week, came up with a comment that single market and services would be deeply destructive for Great Britain. Do you think that's right? or, or well, I don't, I, Number one, I don't think there is a single market in services. No, so but we're trying to work towards a... Nonetheless, I mean, there's a huge number of banks, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan... Banks will locate banks. themselves wherever they want. They just open a branch wherever they like. So, you, you know, so, not so, so you're not worried about the banking, no. about the I'm attrition to the UK, no. the London centre... In fact, it's very protectionist. If you take the industry I'm in, insurance, uh, technically you can passport from Gibraltar to the UK. If you try and passport to France, you can technically do it, but they suddenly hit you with a withholding tax on premiums they find another way to nail you. So the, the culture of European financial I mean, services is, is deeply protectionist. Right. You know. And I do think someone like Goldman Sachs, you know, <coughs> talk about track record. They said we should join the euro. Okay. But, that, that's, but are, it's really important. You can't, the, these are good important. debating points, but they're a very long way from trying to establish whether there's some substance to the passporting point that we've just been discussing. There is no single market in financial services. There won't be one As because you know, there's a protectionist... You know, I just I want to take yeah. you back, Mr. Tice, to I'm going to move questioning on because uh, another colleague particularly wants to come in, and I just want to clarify one point. Uh, and it's a point of detail, but it's a, a reflection, it's the same point I've been making on and off throughout the whole hearing. And it, uh, I regret to say it's a problem with all three campaigns, and probably, although we haven't yet established that, with the government figures as well. We'll see about that in due course. What is your estimate of the Rotterdam Amsterdam effect? Well, um, Rotterdam Antwerp effect. So, Global Britain, which has been uh, carrying out research for over 20 years on the EU and recommending to leave, it's a uh, very reputable research house led by Ian Milne and Ewan Stewart. Uh, they believe that it goes from 44% down into the mid to high 30s. 
well, hang on. You lo- a moment ago, you said the mid thirties. Yes. Uh, no, well, no one, no, no one knows, but their no, estimate, no, their estimate is no, the mid to high thirties. No, it's the mid to high thirties. <coughs> so we're talking about something at least five percent. Uh, yes. Well, if you go from forty-four down to let's say thirty-eight, then yes, that's six percent. That's, that's, six. that's so a, that's a to, significant. That is a I'm significant. I'm trying, trying to find reduction. the highest number that's still in the thirties. It must be at least <laughs> well, five. That's all I'm doing. Yeah. I'm just yeah. taking what right. you're saying yeah. to me. Fair enough. And if I yeah. may say so, it's already altered a bit from when you last presented it to, to the committee, just only a few minutes ago when it was described well, as I don't, mid, I don't think it's altered. I've, I've used, I use one end of the range and there's another end of the range. But well, uh, Andrew Dillnott, who's the chairman of the uh, UK Statistical Authority, uh, estimates the effect is around 2%. In fact, he's recently given evidence saying that, in his view, it's so small as to be scarcely uh, measurable. Uh, I just point that out. Uh, I would suggest at first blush that I would be more likely to take notice of that than other research. They get their numbers wrong from time to time, and they haven't had always a great track record. But on the whole, even weak though it is, sometimes it tends to be better than most other uh, um, statisticians. So I do think we need great care with these figures and I think it's helpful that you have at least identified a source and if you are using the figure in your published documentation I think it's extremely important that you should make sure that you source what you're talking about. We, we can absolutely check our sourcing. I think most of it is, is sourced. But we and maybe have a look at this that. recent evidence. I don't know whether it was in the last few days. I think it might well have been uh, from the ONS. Uh, George Caravan. Thank you for a very entertaining afternoon, gentlemen. Um, uh, Mr. Banks, you, you said that the EU is lousy at negotiating trade deals. How, 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 what benchmark would you use? Well, I think uh, justify you mentioned uh, countries like Switzerland and Iceland that managed to do. I mean, I think there's one in particular, isn't it? Switzerland did it in under 10 months with one particular country. The, pro- the, the so core... Time, time, time. Yeah, time-wise. I mean, the core of the problem is trying to get 28 different countries uh, to... I appreciate it. Uh, if I told you that as best as our excellent research team over here can mm-hmm. estimate, uh, the EU has negotiated 53 preferential trade deals with individual countries or blocks, which is more than any other country or trading group that we can find. On that measuring stick, it does very, very well. But if you look at, as I said earlier, if you look at the cumulative GDP of those, you know, it is significantly less than a small country like Switzerland. So on that basis, it does very poorly. I'm more than willing to admit that individual small countries might have negotiated this or that. But in terms of what is the world's largest trading bloc, largest GDP grouping, it's negotiated the largest number of preferential trade deals. On, on, I think any reasonable person might say that on that basis, the EU does quite well in negotiating. Well, actually, it's not the world's largest trading block. When you take out the UK, it's smaller than the US. I'm sure if you take out X, Y, and Z, it will be smaller than it is at the moment. Well, we are, it, it is we are, at the moment. We are, we are advocating are in, Brexit. Okay, okay, fair enough, fair enough. Right, um, uh, Barack Obama, let's move on. Um, I, I noticed, uh, Mr. Rice, a devotee of your tweets, Mr. Tyson, you said that. Um, uh, actually, Obama helped Brexit. Uh, British people don't like being bullied by dodgy establishment peddling lies. Uh, what lies was it President Obama told? Uh, well, I think that um, you know, people recognised that what he was doing was trying to represent the interests of the United States. And if you That's look what at for. Hmm? That's what he's paid for. Yeah, but if you look at uh, you know you look at lots of those U.S. Treasury uh, former secretaries, for example. Uh, you know, parts of the establishment, many of them employed by Goldman Sachs. I asked President Obama, what what, what were the lies that you were referring to? The the first one, as I referred to earlier, frankly, is that we go to the back of the queue, when actually others, other very senior politicians, Ted Cruz and such like, are saying that actually, you know, we couldn't go, Ted Cruz said in the last 24 hours, we could go to the front of the the line. Mr. Cruz isn't president. No, but he is, he is, uh, he is standing to be president. Well, okay. Who is it negotiates? Who is it ultimately? Well, let me finish. Let me, who is it ultimately in the United States constitutional setup that decides whether to accept a trade treaty or not? Congress. Right. Which is made up of fifty states, represents fifty states, all of whom have different individual needs, requirements, self you know, self interest. 
So you could argue, in fact, the United States is set up very much the same as the EU. So when it comes to actually uh, an in, uh, UK out of the EU, trying to negotiate a trade deal with America, it's exactly in the same situation that you're saying you, you disagree with the view, you yeah. worry about the EU, the EU. Here you have 50 vested interests in 50 states, and you have to get a trade deal, which is why it will take, in President Obama's as, as words, said, five to ten years. As I said earlier, <laughs> we don't have to do a trade deal with the US. The last thing we should be doing is, is a trade deal called TTIP. As I said earlier, we have a bigger surplus in services with the US with whom we don't have a trade deal than we do in services with the EU. You know, trade, trade deals are not the be-all and end-all. You've got to, I think, realise as well that trade deals are one thing. People trade. It's people and companies. It's not governments and you know, laid-down rules. That's why, in, in point of fact, that we're actually trading with America really nicely. You know, we've got a surplus, it's grown, we're exporting more. So this kind of political idea that you have to have this, all these deals, it's just not right. Well, that's, that's fine. I, I yeah. mean, no, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad to take your opinion. But it does seem a little bit at odds with the, the, the Leave.eu website, right. which makes a very big play in our quote, imagine having greater influence over our global trade so that we can do our own deals. We can, so, we can. Right, well, which is it? Either, either deals are important as, as, as a priority for Brexit or they're not. Which is it? The word is can. can. So if it's advantageous to us, then we can do them. But we are in control of our own destiny. That is well, the you fundamental can, difference. You can do the negotiations. You can't deliver yeah, and, the and deals. A, and a deal, is, a deal is a two-sided thing. Indeed, Both which, sides is why, which is why we come back to the fact that President Obama has said that go to the end of the queue, it will take five to ten years to negotiate. So and, others, and others in the States are not saying that. He's not going to be president for very long. His trade representative used to work yeah. in Brussels. I mean, you know, we can go on. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a reasonable person might presume that uh, the, 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 the judgment of the president of the United States is a bit different from the, the doorman in the bar around the corner. Yeah. But we can no, always choose somebody. But I think what the President of the United States says, I mean, as it, as it happens, I actually think that <coughs> um, he didn't have any right to come here okay. and tell British electors what to do. And I, and I, which I, is why I, I use the word... Very critical. Which is why so, I use the word bullying. Like, but that doesn't blame me to the fact that the President of the United States said that. And that I think he represents a view because actually the, 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 if, if, there, if there is a nation, a large nation, a large trading nation, which has had a very tough position even with its so-called friends and allies, when it comes to trading issues, it's the United States. So I, 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 I hardly think that we're looking, if we come out of the EU, I hardly think we're back in a 19th century situation of free trade and quick deals. I think we are in a different situation altogether. And I think, I think a reasonable person has the right to ask you, are you not being rather over-optimistic in what can be achieved in a Brexit situation. Well, I, think go, I think I'd go back to what I said before, that the World Trade Organization has brought tariffs down to such a point that these deals may be advantageous, they may not be. Our trade with America is rising quite nicely. We've got a surplus and it's growing. You don't have to have a free trade deal to trade. Absolutely, absolutely. I appreciate that. But I mean, the, the, if, if, if we're talking about future economic growth, which is very much tied to trade and, and expansion of global trade. <coughs> we all know that the Doha round, a uh, 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 stall, the Doha round, the WTO trade, it stalled for the last couple of decades, precisely because we have removed the easy bit, which is getting down the tariffs on manufactured goods, and we've moved to trying to remove uh, the tariffs, uh, the, the, the internal hidden barriers on trade in services. And we know that that's the most difficult thing to do. And as you've pointed out, we're, we're by no means have created a free market in services in the EU, despite having set up an apparatus to do it. So in that circumstance where the whole world is finding it difficult to, to, to progress, uh, uh, removing trade barriers, non-tariff non barriers for services, what is, what is your evidence that the, that the UK coming out of the group which has had the most success in negotiating trade deals, will be better off and be able to achieve further uh, uh, bilateral deals in removing non-tariff non barriers, so to get the economic growth and the, well, the productivity growth, which is what the UK depends on the, for the future. The, the European Union is unique in the sense that it requires the kind of political union of its members as well as the economic members. 
So the groups well, you're not, talking about... We agreed America is in the same situation. Well, I know, but the group, groups you're talking about do not have economic... Uh, sorry, have political union. So America, as far as I'm aware, is not merged with Canada and Mexico. So it's a much looser grouping of, uh, of countries. So therefore, when it's negotiated or, or it's kind of trying to do things, it's not quite the same, is it? No, but we've already agreed that domestically inside the United States for Congress to agree on a trade deal, yeah. he has to get 50 senators of 50 states... Okay. Uh, 100 senators of 50 states to agree. So it's in exactly the same situation. Uh, once you move to large trading blocks, you're dealing with vast amounts of self-interest. Well, no you need peace negotiation, and I, you need scale. And taking the UK, the arguments of reasonable person, I think, would say, taking the UK out of the EU, remove the scale that the UK, and the political so, clout the UK would have to negotiate. I'm sorry, we just don't accept that. You've asked for evidence. I give, gave you the evidence earlier. A country like Switzerland has negotiated trade deals with a cumulative GDP way, way in excess of the European Union. So we simply don't accept that the European Union is successful at negotiating trade deals. And what the British people are really concerned about, actually, is the last thing they want is the European Union to negotiate a trade deal with the US called TTIP that is being done in secret with no transparency that is going to benefit US multinational corporations to the detriment of UK workers' rights. That's what the UK workers are really, really concerned about. Because it's not in our well, control, I, I, because I we've only got a 9% I, vote. I, I, I happen to agree with you on that. Excellent. But equally, if you went, to, you went to many people in America, many American, American trade unions, they would tell you exactly the same thing. But equally, as I said earlier, the thing that we're really good at, services, we have a very substantial service surplus with the US and no trade agreement. Trade agreements are not the be-all and end-all. Yeah, but we've agreed that. But what we are looking in, in, in terms of the future, in terms of um, Britain's woeful productivity rate, we are talking about opening up UK to more trade, which I think is what you have clearly put as one of the key things in supporting Brexit in, 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 in your, on your website, which refers in large measure to the trade, the trade deals that we could, we could engineer. Yeah. Right. Um, if, we need, if we need that trade access, um, you, apart from, a, apart from, apart from a, a reference to Switzerland, it seems to me that um, the, 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 there's, there's, rel there's relatively little to suggest that the, U the UK would have the scale to negotiate. So if we take China, let's take Chinese. I mean, Switzerland has a trade deal with China. Um, but it's actually terribly one-sided. And in fact, there's actually, I mean, to, to be ridiculous about it, uh, uh, there, there's, there's, there's quite specific prohibitions on, on, how, how, on tariffs on, on um, uh, uh, the export of, of Swiss watches to China, because China is very, very capable of uh, defending its own manufacturing base. So, um, so the question comes back. Um, in, 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 a, in a situation where, where the UK has re removed itself from uh, the, uh, the EU and, and taken out of the, of the, of the, of the, of the major, major negotiation between the blocs. What, what negotiating power do you have apart from all these new businessmen you're going to bring in like yourselves? Are going Absolutely to massive to because we're the fifth largest economy in the world. You know, I mean, if Iceland with 300,000 people can negotiate a trade agreement with China, then the UK, with 65 million people, can absolutely negotiate a free trade agreement with China, if it's in our interest. But let's remember, the EU is China's biggest export partner, and there's no free trade agreement. It comes back to what I said earlier, that you don't have to have a free trade agreement to trade with it. And you picked up on productivity earlier. This is really important. There is a productivity conundrum as to why the UK economy is actually doing relatively well within the EU, and yet our productivity appears to be worse than countries like France. I would suggest to you that actually one of the reasons for that is because we've got an infinite supply of low-skilled labour from the EU, there is less incentive, and therefore wages have been, unfortunately, artificially suppressed. There is less incentive for UK businesses to invest in investment and capital that improves productivity. So you can't have it both ways. I would actually argue it's the other way around, because the, 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 the low investment and the low uh, capital to, uh, to worker ratio has been there since... Uh, you know, for time. 30 or 40 yeah. years. I agree. put it the other way. I think business doesn't want to invest. Or actually we have a set of fiscal incentives that, that uh, uh, prioritise investment in bricks and mortar rather than plant machinery. I and as a result, you have to fill the gap with cheap labour. That's true. But if, yeah. Well, but, it's it's, it's, but, 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 it's, uh, but it's been exacerbated by the free movement of labour. Yeah. Of course it has. Well, you've given some interesting and occasionally some entertaining evidence. We're grateful to you for coming to see us this afternoon. Um, and uh, 
that's not just a perfunctory remark, given how difficult it has been on occasion to get witnesses in the, this particular debate. But if we've managed to get our evidence in before the vote, so we won't need to recall you after it. And we look forward to receiving a good deal of written supplementary material. And we'd like that as soon as possible, please, now. We recognise that you'll be under pressure, but so are we, in order to produce our report uh, on the points that we've raised. And if you have any doubts about what those are, please get in touch with our staff. Uh, a week, as, two weeks. Uh, a week, I would say, uh, would a week will be about as uh, long as we can manage. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure. The proceeding has ended.